put my mic down so you can hear me better. It is Tuesday, March 7th, 2023. The time is 10.02 a.m. And this is the Telluride Town Council regular meeting. Present from council in council chambers is everybody. We love that. Before we start the meeting today, um, we are going to have a moment of silence and Jesse Ray would like to be the one to make a statement. Um, in memory of Jenny Farmer, as she liked to call herself, Farmer Getty Spaghetti, um, she passed away last Tuesday in Montrose. There is no set time or date for a life celebration, but I think she would like everybody to smell the flowers and blow out the candles and just breathe and um, be with each other, care about each other and remember her in the very best possible light. So for Farmer Spaghetti, Farmer Getty Spaghetti, this is a moment of silence. That's good. Thank you, Jesse Ray, and our condolences to everybody in this community who loves Jenny. <clears throat> we are going to move into item one, which is work sessions. There's a couple of changes to the agenda today, and we'll get to those as they come up. So item 1A is discussion on the town's fog or fats, oils, and grease ordinance and program. And we have Karen G to help us with this item. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making time for this subject. And um, it, it's come up again, and it will probably like many of our programs um, that rely on our the public and our the community in general to understand uh, their role in, in making those programs work. But um, sorry to start that as your first morning photo. Um, it's shocking. I didn't know I'd necessarily be the first one up today, but it gives you an idea and puts you in the shoes of uh, our wastewater operators, to be quite frank, um, and our streets crews. Um, in wastewater treatment systems across the country, excess fats, oils, and grease, also known as fog, and I'll refer to it as fog, um, cause problems in wastewater pipes, not only your household pipes, but all the pipes that go from your house all the way to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, if you've ever had a clogged drain, you kind of understand how, how it backs up into your house. Um, and we take uh, at Public Works, our staff takes it from there when there are clogs that form in our pipes. Uh, once it gets jetted, it goes down to the wastewater plant where it kind of mucks up um, the operations there. Um, and that's why in 2011, uh, we started having a conversation about fat soils in Greece um, and putting a program together that um, mimicked a lot of um, our larger municipalities like Montrose has, has a very active fat soils in Greece program. They have an inspector, they have an enforcement thing. So you know, we simplified that for sure, uh, but we put requirements in place with an ordinance that went into place in 2011. And then I'll get a little bit more in 2012. I'll get a little bit more into that. But when grease gets into um, particularly at the wastewater plant, it causes some safety hazards for our operators. You know, as you can imagine, it's greasy, um, slick. It also makes it 
very difficult to clean equipment and make sure anything that's fouled by the grease and other waste products to get that equipment out to clean it becomes very problematic. Um, and so it's a worker safety issue that um, that we start doing some um, renewed efforts at source control. Public health hazards when there's a backup. Um, we've never had this to my knowledge here in town, except maybe once. Um, but and it wasn't a backup. But when you have sewer backups, if it's um, from a fatberg, have you ever heard of the term fatberg? When you're re, I think the great London fatberg was made all the news for a little bit. Um, and that's when fat congeals around all the food stuff and other stuff that's in our wastewater and just creates this big blockage. Um, and how do you get it out? When the worst case scenario is you have to dig down, cut it out, and then actually physically remove that blockage, which is quite expensive, as you can imagine. So public health hazards. And then in terms of our greenhouse gas uh, emissions goals and our desires to be as efficient with our energy use as possible, when um, you have to treat and handle stuff that shouldn't be there to begin with, you're using excess energy to run the pumps, to, you know, to clean up the messes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always a problem with um, creating a, a challenge to meet our greenhouse gas emissions goals, especially for the wastewater plant. So I had mentioned earlier that there's an ordinance in place for the town of Telluride that was put in place in 2012. And along with that ordinance, a great program was put in place we think a very simple program, but I included this so um, you could get a little history and that history is in the memorandum for you as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it talks a little bit about 20, the meetings that were had, the discussions that were had at the community level through a work sessions at town council. Um, and then like why, why would we go to the efforts to really um, make an ordinance that can be enforced and with requirements? Um, and so, you know, it goes through, you know, on this date, on April 24th, 2012, they discuss, you know, <laughs> former council discussed, you know, a years long outreach and education to the food service establishments, we call them restaurants, but that also includes the school because they have a cafeteria, it includes Clark's, any, anybody with food counter who is preparing food um, to let, you know, and that education is, and I'll get into it a little in a little bit more detail, but it's like what goes down the drain and what does not. Um, and then Finally, um, the final whereas on the ordinance uh, when it was adopted is town council continues to find there is a substantial and compelling public interest to protect the municipal wastewater system by promoting the management of excessive fat soils and grease, grease originating from food service establishments. And we know that it's not just restaurants, how many people have fried their turkey at Thanksgiving at their home. Um, so it's also outreach to the community about what goes down our residential drains. So the goal of the, you know, the work session is to make sure you are all aware of this program. It's been almost 10 years. Um, remind everyone in the community about best management practices for proper disposal of fats, oils, and grease. Um, prepare you and affected food service establishments um, in Telluride and Lawson Hill, because we have uh, an agreement with Lawson Hill that they don't put non-acceptable waste down the drain. So that's the nexus to, you know, the two establishments there that are serving food. Um, for increased enforcement of the fog ordinance, um, in case you get calls, you know that staff is out there having conversations. Um, at the very least. And then, of course, to reinvigorate efforts at outreach and education, we're working closely with Lindsay to um, both me and the wastewater um, water supervisor and the public works director trying to figure out a, a way to, to 
to reinvigorate and, and capture people's um, attention when it comes to Greece with a public education outreach. So, um, so what's required in the code? Well, the code requires that food service establishments is, install a grease control device. It's usually the grease trap that's under a, um, a sink. Um, and you have to maintain that. You have to skim the grease off it and put the grease somewhere. And that requires training of personnel that turn over an awful lot. So you can imagine the challenge of, of some of the education and outreach and you know, on this particular subject. So regularly clean out those devices when they're basically 25% full, keep records of the clean out schedule, keep records of the invoices for hauling away grease trap cleanings if there are any, um, and same for used fryer oil. Um, in the past, um, we've, we've been working with our, um, with the county health inspector who's in uh, food service establishments already doing inspections to remind them of their obligations of our ordinance. Mountain Village also has the same ordinance. Um, so it seemed like a really good way to always have this knowledge, um, having the conversation. Um, however, like many staff, um, the the health inspector has a lot of things on their mind, not just fats, oil, and grease. So um, we're going to do more outreach on both our side and Mountain Village's side. Um, they have staff that's available to go have conversations once again about what's required in the ordinance and what our best management practices. I included in your packet a cute little like trifold that we hand out to. Um, in quantities to each food service establishment. Um, it's available also. We provide it in Spanish for our Spanish speaking community and workers. So um, to try to bridge that gap as well. But as I said, we're also trying and we have always tried to outreach to the public. And when we talk about the public, I, I put on this slide, anyone who uses a sink shower or toilet. Um, <laughs> It just seems reasonable. Um, what people may not be aware of, because for so long we were told, you know, minimize your trash. So that's why we have disposals on in our sinks, right? And that's part of the problem with the BOD, that the soaring BOD, biological oxygen demand, that uh, is one of the drivers for the wastewater treatment system upgrades. It's like, don't put food down there. At this point, we're working, you know, on the 360, all of the options. So once we get composting more firmly established in our community on a much broader scale, I'm hoping that people will stop using their sink disposal units. Um, and that's not just not, again, in Telluride, that's all across the country with wastewater operators face in new communities facing this issue. So. The outreach that's occurred over the years, this happens to be the Christmas one, um, dry wipe your pots and pans and dishware with a paper towel prior, prior to dishwashing, hand washing or putting it in your dishwasher and put that greasy mess into your trash. Um, never pour used cooking oil down the drain. Everyone always asks me, what do I do with it? I have like a half a gallon because I did some special thing. Well, get some kitty litter, pour it on the kitty litter to absorb it. Then you can put it in a bag and throw it out as a solid. Never put liquid, again, not down the drain and don't put liquid grease into your trash container either because then our wastewater, our waste haulers have it dripping all the way down to Natarita. Um, and as I said earlier, compost food waste, put or, or put it in the garbage, not down the drain. So I mentioned in conclusion, we're reinvigorating the program for outreach and education and enforcement of 
the FOG ordinance and the FOG management program. We're going to continue to work with San Miguel County um, environmental health specialists to help get the word out on a regular basis. He actually, when we had a recent conversation, um, Chris Smith sent a blast to all uh, establishments that are on the system and maybe all establishments in the county. I don't know. But um, about how you properly deal with fats, oils, and grease. So that's great to have partners um, there and in Mountain Village. Initiate a new campaign to educate the public about proper handling and disposal of fog in residential kitchens. And work with the town of Mountain Village, and we're already doing that. We've continued to do that over the years. Um, but we both mentioned um, talking to Finn Jomi. He's like, yeah, it's kind of fallen to the back burner. We need to reinvigorate it. Um, work with festivals and, and actually um, Parks and Rec does a terrific job working with festivals regarding the requirements of fog management. Uh, the uh, sink, the festival sink, uh, has a grease trap that was installed a couple of few years ago, and the um, festival managers are responsible for disposing of it properly. Um, meet with the food service managers. Um, I believe that's going to be me and then my uh, counterpart in Mountain Village to remind them of the ordinance and its requirements and step up enforcement if needed. Generally, everyone just you know gets busy. It's one of those kinds of things. This is a housekeeping measure. Um, but if if there are particular problems, um, we'd like to have that option and have you understand that it is a very a last resort option to um, ensure fines or close temporarily the restaurant. Um, and so I've got all of my pamphlets uh, ready. I've got a copy of the ordinance ready for each uh, food service establishment. It's going to, uh, meetings are going to occur over the next two weeks before the end of the season, before I lose their attention. And then, um, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Do you all have any questions? Thanks, Karen. And I, I'm going to ask one just real quick before I go to general questions. I, I didn't see in here and I didn't hear you say, is there any desired change to the existing ordinance as it's currently written where we would need to have um, other meetings to consider that? Not at this time, okay. no. Thank you. Questions? So I had been under perhaps what is a false impression that um, vegetable oils like a canola oil that are liquid at a room temperature are okay to go down the drain. Is that incorrect? We don't parse oil. It should not go down the drain. No oil period down the drain. Okay. Thank yes. You, Karen. Thank you for that clarification. Good question. Do we have this sort of information for residential or civilian use uh, with the tourism board going out with their, you know, serve water and stay on the trails and drink our water, don't buy bottled water? We did at one point. Um, and with the, it was part of the live like a local kind of campaign. Um, with the shift in and the re, well, the reimagining of that program, um, certain things dropped off, like the bear stuff. Well, no, the bear stuff stayed on, but like where to put your used batteries or other more mundane things. <laughs> so we're working with Lindsay to figure out how to um, bridge that gap, and she'll reach out to, yeah, the tourism board. Why would we not require drain strainers for all short-term rentals that have a, a disposal system? Because then it makes it much easier for people to take their food waste and just put it in the trash. I'm not talking about oil, I'm just talking about food waste, but it would seem like that would be the smart way to go or to encourage people. The disposal? What? You mean get rid of the disposal? Well, no, well, people next. already have a disposal there. So why not just put a, a a mesh thing that allows the water to go through, but collects like blocks, it. blocks exactly. the vegetables. And mm -hmm. my wife throws all sorts of vegetables down the drain. Mm -hmm. and I was just thinking I need to go to Ace and get a strainer so that she, because I don't. I think it today's, this morning's first half hour of your meeting would be a tremendous success if everybody was inspired to go and get, get and do exactly that. 
We took and out help our garbage with. disposal and put in a regular drain. Mm -hmm. Karen, for um, restaurants and bigger institutions that serve food, there used to be one Mountain High Fire and Safety that would do that type of stuff. Is there another like service provider that goes in and cleans grease traps and hoods and things of that nature? Yes. If um, and I'll I'll refer to this uh, the brochure. I we just read done the list and called everybody. There's at least um, one gentleman collects used fryer oil and then one, two, three, four, five different um, servers, uh, folks that come by and clean grease traps and service them. The numbers are accurate. The names of the businesses are accurate. And so getting that information um, into the hands of folks who need it when it's an emergency yeah is is challenging but if there's i've had folks call me and ask who do i call and that's fine i'm i'm happy to put them in touch with any of these these um folks because we've have had challenges in the past where somebody was relying on uh for used fryer oil they were relying on a contractor and they just bolted one year and didn't call anybody and there was an entire basement full <laughs> of used fryer oil all ready for pickup and no place for it to go. Um, and that was, we were alerted to that at Public Works mm -hmm. through our partnership with the county who told us there's, there's a really big problem right here. Do you know about it? And what can we do to help things out? And so Public Works in the town at that point um, called up Titan Grease They and people could come and drop off their excess grease for a period of time. and. Um, and that's just not a permanent solution in any sense, but it was an emergency response solution that worked really well for the community. Um, so people do call, you know, it's a regular thing that happens. And um, now also the Chris Smith at the county has the updated list that he can refer to as well. And if you're listening on the radio, that list is in this packet, which you can find. Yes. Yes. So I actually have a lot of questions, but I think it's partly because the overarching concern in my head is we are about to embark on a, I don't even know the number anymore, 60 to 80 million is what I'm going to throw out there, dollar renovation and upgrade to our wastewater plant. And if this is a problem that according to your memo looks worse than it did in 2011 when this ordinance was passed, that's kind of a big red flag. Um, I'll go kind of out of order of what I would have asked because of um, Jesse Ray's question just now and your okay. response. Do we have any knowledge of these haulers of the fog, what they are actually doing with that product when they have collected it because I looked through the ones on the list and coincidentally a lot of them are also septic haulers which makes total sense and every time we talk about fees and wastewater septage dump fees comes up it kind of got my wheels spinning. That's a really interesting you know perspective um Right off the top of my head, septic haulers, if there was grease in the septic, um, in the septic or mixed in with it, uh, we would see it at a different place in the plant because the septics bypass the raw sewage lift station that is, you know, close to the trail and the that you pass if you're going out the Galloping Goose Trail that way. Um, so the the photos in the packet are in that lift station. That's the worst part. We are seeing sheens of grease uh, further in the plant. And that's likely because of um, when people get, when there's a larger um, fatberg um, and the lines need to be jetted, if there's a problem, they'll put kind of a dispersant in there, kind of like when they put dispersants, when there's uh you know, for the horizon oil spill in the Gulf at the time, right? So you can see it, it's kind of like Dawn, you put it on the grease and all your grease like kind of 
goes away suddenly. So it can bypass, some of it congeals, the majority of it congeals by the time it gets to the um, raw sewage lift station. And that's where we see it. Some of it bypasses that because it's still in solution. And we may be seeing some vegetable oil sheen. Um, a little bit of fat soils and grease isn't terrible for the wastewater plant. The bugs can eat it. When you get too much, it's a problematic and you see a shift in the bugs that are eating our treatment or treating the waste, eating the waste basically. And so that can create problems uh, in terms of how, how we're meeting our standards, how well we're meeting our standards. So you want a specific, you know, it's like your friends, you want a specific group over for dinner and you have a dinner. And then if somebody, you know, like if somebody just shows up, you know, it can disrupt things, uh, the happy event and, and how things proceed. But so I'm not that concerned. Also grease haulers are licensed with the state and they have to have a disposal plan in order to do that. And so that's the next step checking to make sure all of these guys are licensed with the state as is required by state law. Okay. And they may be too small in terms of grease hauling to fall within uh, the state's requirements. So we but, don't really know. Well, we knew, yes. Well, we know they're taking it away usually to rendering plants. Some are doing it to, you know, to like Titan, who's not on this list as out of Grand Junction because they do large scale. They, um, they have a, a agreement with an agriculture rural producer for hog food, um, but I can get that information. That would be cool. And then um, I think I saw you shift for a question, but I'm gonna ask my other main one, I guess, which is a two-part question. And it's because you brought up potentially actually acting on enforcement, which is where every topic we ever bring up, it all comes down to enforcement in the end. Um, I was curious if there had been any historic enforcement of this over the past decade, and if so, what that may have looked like, and if there is a monetary value associated with said enforcement, because we keep talking about ways of finding money for our wastewater plant upgrade, and if it is getting, you know, it would abused in some way. Anyway, just, a, just um, pondering, and then the second part of that question was, and you may have kind of answered it, but I'm still a little unclear. Is there a regular process for how this compliance is tracked? Are people at FSEs, food service establishments, are their documents being reviewed every year so that we know just by looking at it, which they're required to keep those records? And if we aren't, would that just be an easier way to stay on top of it? Like, are they submitting their maintenance for? these things for review and yep. then if somebody has a red flag then the appropriate department deals with it i think uh the answer is to the second question is yes um it was originally we have um our county health inspector was requiring and looking at those records um and that doesn't happen anymore. And that's one of the reasons I'm showing up to say, if you don't have your records, you better start keeping them because it's required by the ordinance. And I'll be back in the spring after, you know, to, to check on this. Um, again, it's like many of our ordinances, we don't have the staff to do this regularly. It may be possible to require um, now that things are more electronic, that it you know, that every food service establishment sends their records for the year electronically to somebody at staff to review it. Um, at that point, if they're not, you've got a year's worth of non-compliance that, I mean, we can, I guess, from a practical standpoint, in terms of the fat going down, we're possibly going down the drain that won't be hindered, but it would improve on food service establishments protocols to make sure these things are being taken care of. 
Um, in terms of enforcement, you or what happened, um, we did not enforce this. It's, uh, but it it is an issue with Greece, um, massive amounts of Greece, and I won't mention which restaurant it was. Um, but they were shut down during for two weeks, and part of that was over the Fourth of July weekend because. Um, there was it, there was such a fire hazard created by um, grease that was in you know the air the the vents um, and the vents had been disconnected so it was a huge fire hazard and what was discovered also were there were buckets of grease everywhere um, and so that had to be cleaned up as well so we didn't do the enforcement or the shutdown the fire department did. Um, we have had uh, challenges even with proper maintenance um, where we've had overflows of grease uh, into the street um, and had to deal with that before it went to uh, the ice house pond in the river. Um, and it was dealt with very effectively and, and I, by the owner, they were very serious about the cleanup, et cetera. Um, so that was an accident that happened that um, they were shut down for a couple of hours, actually, while they figured out what the heck was going on. Um, so I guess my question would be, I hear you going door to door to review people's records is going to take a lot of time. Um, it seems almost like a very, I don't know, it seems prudent to me to maybe have staff discuss what this could look like that it, and maybe this is where in my head, I thought an ordinance change may be necessary is to require people to submit their records so that staff isn't going door to door and like having to like search it all up. Like um, business license renewal time. Perhaps. Sure. Uh, you know, because it seems like you can just stay on top of it that way. So we don't get into a, a bad place again, but Again, that's administrative, and if staff thinks that that mm -hmm. is a logical thing, and if the rest of council thinks that that's a prudent thing to do, just we don't want to, you know, build this brand new sparkly facility and then have issues within the first couple of years from something that is preventable potentially. And I agree. I feel like that's been a discussion that the Ecology Commission is like you can you can educate people until until you're blue in the face, but ultimately it's the level of accountability that you require of the community um and it seems like we already have the ordinance that it's just a system that is a perhaps at a higher level and i think it's kind of relying on the county to just sort of do what we need them to do perhaps that's like another well that's just shifted i mean i think there's still cooperation there but that that um because of the level of of activity <laughs> For every all staff, it's just something that they can't um, help us with anymore. So we need to take it back in house, you know. Except for the cursory blast out, and that you know it's easy, and and having conversations when they're in, you know. So there's just more than one person on occasion going in and saying something. But um, in terms of enforcement, I mean. At the bottom of the first page of your memo, um, the last sentence says, emphasize enforcement of the rules will occur, th occur through civil fines that are in the town's municipal code. And I'm not sure what the civil fines currently are. Up to $1,000. Well, it doesn't say per day specifically, at least in that section, but it could be assessed as such, I guess. But we're not the judge. <laughs> Tra ultimately, trying to fix the problem going forward and create a scenario where it is as um, less burdensome on staff as possible. So that if it's a standard submittal and you just know it's coming kind of thing, that's my train of thought. And sorry, I did have one more question. Are there food service establishments that we know of that actually do not have the required infrastructure because they existed as food service establishments before the ordinance was passed. Everybody no, has it to get a license from the county. They won't give you a food permit to serve without. Okay. Because the way it was worded is if the, ch if there's a change in use and then you have to put it in. So mm -hmm. the county actually required it. 
requires. Just the, and the building code. I mean, if yeah. you if you're changing over an area, if you have a food service establishment, we have requirements. And now, yeah. you know, okay, it makes sense for them. Um, be considering how old some of the in the core of town some of the buildings are and even continuing how old their sewer systems are you know their service lines are and some of these facilities um it behooves them to to do the right thing on this um and so yeah i think that i all of these ideas are very valid um I think overall the town is doing okay. We know there was, you know, an event in um, Mountain Village this um, January on a line, um, and you know they had to deal with that issue um, by jetting, and um, we've reestablished those connections so they know to call our wastewater guys so they know what's coming down, and. You know, it's a lot of troubleshooting. There's a whole bunch of stuff that go to the wastewater treatment plant. We were just talking about Marpets, our operators. Blue jeans. Even more mundane tampon applicators. I mean, our operators sit there with a pool skimmer, getting those off of the clarifier. Um, you know, and there's just a whole host of things, the flushable wipes that are not flushable. So um we also have pamphlets to go into all of the utility bills that have been sent out twice um, in the last 10 years. Um, they're also available in Spanish that to help people understand, you know, no, no pharmaceuticals down the toilet. There's just a whole host of things that we, I think we all come from different places and there's different ways that we've dealt with these things in the past, but uh, so to get everyone on the same page, it's only human waste and regular toilet paper that goes down the drain. Everything else goes in the trash, everything. So thanks for starting our morning off with this live fascinating topic. But just to double check, I want to make sure, is there anybody on council who's opposed to the idea of staff looking into just a recurring? Okay, so direction from council would be look into that, see what the possibilities of it are. Okay, cool. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Karen. And wonderful job in the play, by the way. Oh, thank you. Item 1B, thank you for your patience to our next presenter. Item 1B is the Telluride Historical Museum Annual Report, and we have Museum Director Kiernan Lannan with us. Hi, Karen. <laughs> this thing up. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to fulfill my legal obligation to be here. <laughs> uh, I always have a time when I'm here. Uh, anyway. So I don't know that it would be. Oh, first of all, Karen Lennon, Executive Director of the Federal Historical Museum, for the record. Um, oops, that might, wouldn't really be a year or any report if I didn't have to detail uh, probably our finest tradition here at the museum, which is wholesale staff changes. <laughs> well, somewhat. Uh, we lost. Um, Mary Higgins, our director of public engagement, and Katie Swick, our museum assistant. They went on to do great things other than nonprofits, gosh darn it. Um, we did get Teresa Kanishek back to serve as director of education outreach. Um, we brought on Suzanne Katzman to serve as one of our front desk staff. And one other note that Kathy Rohr, our longtime, collect longtime collections manager, is retiring, retiring, retiring this year, which is great for her, sad for us. So the tradition will continue to roll on this year. So let's talk a little bit about the kind of good and bad of the year. 
first of all, the good. Um, we have that top graph with our total contributions trend. This is both memberships and donations. This is our second most we've ever had in a year with 101,034 is the total for 2022. It's the best in the past five years, and it's only eclipsed by 2017, which had a little bit just a smidge higher than that. So really good year for that. Our museum store is continuing to do really, really, really well, um, which we're proud of. It's put a lot of work into it. Uh, a few other things for the good. Um, probably the best thing that we've had this year has been our annual exhibit, the Long Run 50 Years in the Telluride Ski Area. He tells the history of the ski resort over the past 50 years so it comes kind of backwater outpost ski area to a world-class resort and all the changes in culture and such on the town um if you haven't seen it shame on you seriously by this point people but uh it is up until april 1st um probably the best new program that we introduced was our dog museum we don't allow dogs inside the museum. <laughs> um, we've gotten some complaints from dogs uh, that they feel kind of left out. So we did this outdoor exhibit, uh, complete with smell stations so they could smell their history. Um, dog interactives like our dog Sluice, which was just basically dogs playing in a pool to get tennis balls. Is there more fitting gold than tennis balls to dogs? I don't think so. but. Um, and a photo backdrop, among other things, sponsored by Funding. Thank you very much for it. Um, yeah, it went really well. It was well received. We are thinking about doing it again this year. Uh, additionally, we had some success with some programs, including um, especially our Fireside Chats program, which, again, had a lot to do with the history of the ski area. Uh, it was the best attended Fireside Chats. They were up at uh, Madden. Not very much. Um, that went really well. And then... Probably the other really great program we had was our Haunted Hospital, which we brought back this year, uh, considering it was you know, moderately safer regarding COVID. Um, that went really well. We had 281 people go through. Um, it is the last time we're doing it, though, so we went out with a bang. It's just really hard on the building. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about the building in a minute here. But the building, I think, will appreciate not having all the running, screaming <laughs> adults and children. Uh, one thing that I haven't talked about a lot um, is just how well received we are, I guess. Uh, it just it feels a little arrogant, but we'll go through it. Um, I did, for reasons that I'm now sitting here wondering why, ask ChatGPT to, to rewrite some of our <laughs> reviews and the style of some of our um, greatest writers in civilization. Uh, bear with me. Anyway, uh, we have a 4.7 out of 5 rating on Google and Facebook, a 4.5 on TripAdvisor. And, you know, um, that said, a little bone to pick. Um, we have fallen now, and, and, and this is going to be a plea, people. We've fallen to fourth in things to do. Mm -hmm. First in my heart, but behind the gondola. Okay, fine. Worthy opponent. Bear Creek Falls, still. Main Street, which would make no sense without us, frankly. And then we're in a tie with the Judd Beebe Trail. <laughs> Seriously, people? <laughs> Trails, nature. Who worked hard on that? <laughs> I'm not saying my compensation is linked to these reviews, people, but. I'm not saying it's not. So let's get on. <laughs> anyway, let's get it. Um, our visitation trends. Now, these, these aren't terrible in a vacuum. We had 6,520 people come through the museum. Uh, it does fall from our 2018, 2019, 2017 sort of highs of 9,248. We had hoped we would recover a little bit more over 2021, which still had pandemic impacts. We were closed for a, a couple stretches there in 2021. So only having 400 more people come through the museum was a little bit of a disappointment, though I understand that there are some stresses on the, the tourism economy here, generally speaking, if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, 
I am not saying that I'm willing to bet my midlife crisis ponytail on this, but I do believe we're going to bounce back pretty strong this year based on our winter numbers, um, which have been very, very good, among the best we've had ever. So it seemed to be trending in the right direction. However, this did have a trickle-down effect um, with regard to our tours, walking tours in particular, one of the weakest years we had for those in some time. So I was hoping that things will flip back a little bit to a more positive note in the summer. Um, the building. So this is a picture from pre-restoration, and it's not what happened with the building, but it's what it felt like um, at times. The building just kind of gave up on us a little bit, actually more the systems. Uh, the heating system popped out in October, uh, the second and third floor, forest air, air heating system popped out in October. Um, the first floor in floor heat said, oh, just you wait. It conked up uh, in November, so we had no heat for a while. Uh, but the forest air, hot air heat has been repaired. We no longer have to burn the furniture. So we're feeling great about that. Um, in addition, our accessibility lift, our security system, and I guess somewhat appropriate, our toilet, ended up malfunctioning, among other things. Uh, the toilet was just a flusher. We're, we're, we're doing everything we can. Please don't come and knock on the door. Um, doing everything right, I should say. Uh, at any rate, um, we did get a lot of these repaired. Um, the accessibility lift is being repaired, hopefully within a week or so. Um, we did take on the cost of it ourselves, which um, counter to our service agreement with the town, so it's something we're going to have to discuss, but um, in the before day, before there was a superhero in the maintenance department. Uh, I had uh, probably better luck getting things taken care of with trying to get the neighborhood cat to run walking tours. So that is what it is, but we'll, we'll be discussing that from Scott. So, but we're, we're doing much better. Some <coughs> projects. That we're taking care of. We do have a Spanish language translation of our audio, audio tour. So if um, there's something that's of interest to you, just definitely come check it out. Um, we got help with that from the collaborative action for immigrants, Kathy. So big, big help there. IT upgrades. We went from something that MacGyver was really proud of to something he's mildly disappointed in, but it is an upgrade. Think about it that way. Um, pretty much done. Have a few computers I need to install. Uh, the big one is our collection storage move. Um, we are moving our offsite storage from Montrose to um, the storage facility, new storage facility in Million. That is going to be incredibly costly, time consuming. It's not stressing me out. I just lost a few years of my life. But uh, we're going to get that done this year. And it's going to be much better con uh, conditions for our collection. It's not the buzziest thing for people to be aware of, but it's one of the more important things for us is to take care of our historical artifacts in a way that will allow them to be around for years and years and years to come. So um, it might be the last thing I do, but we're going to get it done. It's going to be one of the more important things. We're also working with the Samuel County Historic Commission on Trailside Interpretive Panels. Uh, so this summer, if you're down in Keystone, Georgia, you can see some regarding the Keystone Plaster Operation there. Um, if you're walking the Galloping Goose Trail towards the Hull Shoots as well, you're going to see a tome of information on that panel. Uh, it's over by the, will be over by the county's picnic area. Um, so you want to check that across from the, Ilium, the old Ilium Potter Station. The uh, last one is what it is. It's like our, our version of SOMA. Annual Exhibit 2023 will revolve around Telluride's Festival of History. Um, Molly Daniel, our curator of collections and exhibits, is very hard at work. <clears throat> you might have something to contribute, artifact to, to land stories, whatever else you might have. Please give us, uh, drop us a line. We drop Molly a line at molly at telluridemuseum.org. That's your email. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it for our year. I'm happy to answer any questions. 
addressing the concerns. Thank you, Karen. I'm going to start at this end this time, Dan. Any questions or comments? Here? I have a couple. Um, in your revenue side of things, do you guys ever um, seek out grants? I didn't see anything. You do. There wasn't a line item in the budget that we got in the packet. Uh, no, it uh, kind of all collapses under contributions. Okay. And then um, has anybody from the Open Space Commission reached out to you guys about helping with information on our new kiosk at the Bio or at Bear Creek Falls Trailhead? No. Okay, good to know. Uh, we'd, we'd be happy to help out. Uh, we can be a little more timely with it. Some of those panels that we've been uh, talked about here have been in March for about two years, so two and a half years, but we can be more, a little more timely with that. There's quite some nature of it. Cool. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Left the museum, stoked about the new exhibit. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just say, as the board liaison for the museum, it's my pleasure to serve on the museum board. I also was one of the staff people that had bigger hopes and dreams, I suppose, and left the museum. But I mean, I'll I'll come back someday, I'm sure. Um, I just wanted to clarify with the collections comment that you made, Kiernan, that the collections have been in Montrose and now they are moving closer to us in Ilium, which I, I think is a component of that. We're not just moving them for funsies, it's to have them closer and climate regulated and all of that kind of, is it climate? No? Yeah, climate, yeah, climate yeah. control. Okay. Um, I think that's an important yeah. detail of that. It, it, it certainly is. It's easier to care for them when they're only 15, 20 minutes on the road, close to an hour and a half, which can turn into a whole day real quick. Yeah, um, I guess my question outside of what seems to be perhaps some funding mm -hmm. regarding the um, building maintenance, mm -hmm. is there anything else that you might need from us <laughs> as the town or town council in support of future endeavors? So one of the things that, um, risk a little bit here, I think, uh, getting some hot water, but bring it up. Um, one of the things that I think might be helpful for us in terms of doing events is to take kind of take a look at some of uh, the restrictions we put on to ourselves with regard to use of our amphitheater, which I believe were um, trades for zoning incentives with the uh, amphitheater quit in. Now, this was back in 2010, I want to say. Maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. I picked that up. But uh, right now, we're pretty restricted in what we can do with that. Um, we have some events coming up that we'd like to try to do. So it's something, I don't know if there's anything that can be done. I know we, we made those agreements, um, but that is something we, we would like, maybe want to look at sooner. And so just for clarification, the museum has this amazing amphitheater that they really can't like have amplified sound. They can't really do anything with it other than like have people sit outside sometimes and like listen to lectures or like not really because it's so there's no speaker anyway I just feel like us as partners with the museum would be helpful and checking those out and seeing if there's any way that we can modify it and in, in um, sort of honor of what they're trying to do and educate the public about our history is it like an extra sound restriction that's separate from the normal town sound or it's a separate agreement yeah yeah in the PNZ approval, correct. Which maybe maybe it's I don't know. There's a, a lot of details that need to be sorted, probably at staff level. But oh yeah, I um, think so. Anyway. so I'm going to jump the gun and just say, is council generally in favor of having staff talk to the planning department and look into the PNZ approval for the amphitheater and how that could potentially be modified? I yes. think I'm seeing nodding and thumbs up all around, just so staff has clear direction. <laughs> Anything else? Can we see? Can we see some of that language? Can we see what the restrictions are? Yeah. It probably just says no amplified sound, right? I'm guessing it has a list. There, there is a list. There's a limit on the number of events we can do, the times that we go to. I think a lot of that details within the neighborhood itself. That's right. less of a concern. Um, sound is a big one. Um, and the number and frequency of events as well. Not that we want to blow it out, but yeah, but it's there. It's we don't get to, it's it's the best place to launch. But other than that, we don't really get to use it too too much. So. Yep. That was it for me. I'm curious just to tech. Is there anything else other than having conversations with the town about maintenance of our building where the museum is housed, helping alleviate the burden on your 
budget from repairs perhaps that were made. Karen, quick question. You have a deficit of something like 17,000. Your building costs were around 29. How much of that cost yeah. is, is would you contribute to our overseeing or not overseeing the building? So if we reimbursed you for all the stuff that mm -hmm. was our responsibility, do you have an idea of what that number would be? Yeah, six to 7,000 at this point. Oh, okay. So it's not terrible. There are all other line items that collapse under the building line that aren't specifically repairs, but in terms of those system repairs, it's six to seven. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, great work. Dan? No additional questions from me. Thank you, Karen. Great job. Sorry, people what keep leaving for better, bigger and better. Or not better, bigger, different things. Sorry. <laughs> better. It's better. No, it's our motto of ambassadors everywhere in town. You do. And I and every person who has been in your employ and then has gone on to different things, when I have spoken to them, they reminisce quite regularly on how great it was to work there. And uh they miss it. So that's very telling. Sure. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Karen and Scott Robson here, and, and just want to thank you for, for all the work that you do over the museum. I, I would love to uh, uh, work with you and our public works department and facilities maintenance uh, team to just make sure that this spring and summer, we've got a really tight list of, of capital improvement needs at the museum. So we are just properly budgeting in, in 2024 for what's out there. I know there's some some significant dollar items that the museum is in need of that are likely the town's responsibility. So let's uh, just look forward to putting together that list with you and, and make sure we've got a, a really robust budget built for next year. Yeah, we already started that process. That's great. The, the public works yeah. book, so. And thanks to Americo. I know he's our facility maintenance uh, manager who's been working with you a lot and getting out in the museum more than in the past uh, with previous staff. So appreciate Americo. Uh, yeah, we're building a statue in America. It's, it's, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. If there's any way to get to help, and we appreciate it. So. Yeah. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. We don't want you to miss your legal obligation, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> I always look forward to legal obligations. They make my year. Thank you. Okay. Item 1C on our agenda is actually going to be postponed, I believe, until March 28th. Scott? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this was a request for funding from San Miguel County to um, share in some of the costs to pave the Bridal Veil parking lot. Um, we don't have uh, uh, hard numbers on that request quite yet. Uh, that will be coming from uh, County Manager Mike Bordonia uh, in the in the coming days here. Uh, but we didn't uh, have that ready for this morning's conversation. But um, I, I think we do want to just you know tee the tee the issue up that the the county does have some uh, funds from uh, through a CDOT grant, as I understand, to to pave from the end of the road uh, near Idorado um, up to the uh, parking lot. Um, but for the parking lot themselves or itself, uh, the county is going to be uh, reaching out to the town uh, to help share in some of that cost. Again, I don't have a hard number for you this morning, but uh, we'll have that on your agenda on March 27th. 28th. 28th. Thank you. And then, Scott, did you, are you going to pass along those concerns from the open space um, regarding? I did hear that. It just because so, that probably will add to cost if there's like erosion concerned to stormwater drainage. Yeah, we did hear uh, last evening at Open Space Commission just some you know, overarching concerns around um, if the if the lot is paved, um, what does runoff look like? How do we mitigate that? And what costs would be associated with that as well? So um, yeah, we'll make sure we pass some of those along. And uh, it will no doubt, uh, just through the county's own regulations, uh, need to have a you know, robust drainage plan on that, that lot. But we'll make sure we kind of tee up the pros and cons. Paved, dirt, paved. That's right. It's a muddy mess. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll look to uh, have that on the uh, March 28th agenda, Mayor. 
Thank you. Um, just while we're on that topic, that is going to be a rather robust and full meeting day. And I'm just curious if anyone knows right now if they are not going to be here for that meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have administrative reports, some of them, number two, on our agenda. Since we are running ahead of schedule at this point, we may add some others from our administrative reports section. 2A is the manager's report. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to kick this um, back to uh, Karen Goulimon, our uh, town environmental engineer, and we've got our 2022 um, water use report. It's an annual report that uh, that uh, Public Works puts together through uh, some third parties as well. And I think it's really uh, telling on an annual basis. I think we've got over 10 years of history in this water report. So it's really uh, telling to look at some of the water users where, um, where we're seeing some growth, where we're seeing some uh, water savings. But certainly, um, I think that this water report is as important as ever as we really uh, now have an adopted climate action plan. We are really, I think, doubling down on conservation efforts uh, from irrigation to everything in between. So I'll um, hand it off to Karen here real quickly, and then I've got a number of uh, updates for you, Mayor, after Karen. Hey, hello, everyone again. Hello again. Um, this is a cleaner part of my conversations <laughs> with you this morning. We're talking about potable water. Um, and our water sources. So as Scott um, has indicated, the town um, the, count the town has a, a water uh, efficiency plan uh, that is um, these plans are encouraged by water, you know, Colorado's water broader water plan. Every municipality um, having been working on this for the past, you know, since 2014, um, every municipality I recommend do this. It really informs how, um, where your water is going, how much you produce, um, and how much is quote unquote lost. Um, the Water Conservation Board provides a template for the report. So the report, um, the water efficiency plan, which is different slightly than the water audit you have in your packet. Um, but the template is very prescriptive about what parts are all in there. Um, I believe the updated water plan is available on the town's website. Um, and they also, the Water Conservation Board, provides free training for staff to conduct these annual water audits. Um, there is a, an engineering standard that the American Water Works Association has and um, a very specific um, um, set of data that goes into this so that um, eventually up in the higher reaches, um, all our data can feed the, the broader um, state to understand how well we are doing with our water systems in general. Telluride developed its first water efficiency plan, as I said, in 2014. Uh, the plan was reviewed and approved by CWCB staff, as was the update. Um, the current updated plan, um, it was updated in 2020, adopted by council in 2020, and it runs through 2027. It has very specific uh, tasks to undertake uh, to continue doing and new tasks. One of them is the landscape update, um, the, the guidelines update. Um, Staff receive training, as I said, um, and conducts uh, the annual water audit. Um, the water audit, we didn't do our water plan because out of the generosity of our hearts, um, it was originally brought up to us that it would be a benefit to the town uh, to do this, to better tighten up our water systems operations and water treatment operations. And so it is a requirement of our comprehensive settlement agreement with Idorado Mining Company. And so um, it can't fall off, you know, in, in the future. We'll have to update the water plan in 2027 to go from the next, for the next 10 years, ideally. I think only seven years, though. I think the state only lets you do it in seven year increments. So I stand corrected. Um, 
but also the annual water audits, you will get regular reports and these are shared with Idorado. Um, so they can, but it, it's a wonderful tool. Um, it's really neat. Um, the water plan um, identifies our shared vision for our water resources, which is essentially to actively conserve, develop, protect and manage our water resources for present and future generations. And that photo is um, a spring photo um, or early summer photo, most likely, um, yeah, maybe July, of Blue Lake, um, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource and uh, provides us with a great deal of resiliency in our water system. Um, I'm going to go through this briefly, just because I think, again, the more we all, uh, you all and the public knows about how our water system is um, and some of the planning that's gone into it and some of the management we do for it, um, I think that uh, it's it, it helps answer a lot of questions that tend to wander about, especially as the broader media is paying attention to Colorado River um, drought. Um, it's hard to say that with the amount of snow we've gotten and all the stuff that we keep hearing in, in California, but uh, Lake Powell, Lake Mead are very low. And so there's a lot of questions, what are we doing? Um, Telluride has three water treatment plants. The primary one is Mill Creek. The secondary one is Pandora, which is out at the end of the valley and to the east. And our emergency backup is Cornette Creek, which is also known as Stillwell Tunnel. Um, we have four water storage tanks. Um, Pandora, which is out at Royer Lane, is 750,000 gallons. We have two up at Stillwell. If you do the Judd Weeby and go up that way, you see that water plant and the two tanks uh, that are there that provide storage, they're east, each about 250,000 gallons. Um, when you look at capital plans, you see we're relining them and reworking them. We found documentation, the original, like one of the original, original rock <clears throat> storage tanks up there that we still have that basis was in 1890 something that it was created. And then all of the, the history of it being upgraded and lined and upgraded and lined. And so we're still relying on a, a really um, solid water uh, supply system that um, has come down to this uh, tiny town um, from its origins. Uh, Lawson Hill, there is a tank at Lawson Hill. It is still being refurbished. Um, we've done the engineering and um, hoping to get that online in the next couple of years that will provide um, just better system resiliency and actually better fire flows out there in, in Lawson Hill, which is one of the region's fire um, hazard areas. Um, and then not, let's not forget that with um, Pandora water system, uh, the town, uh, got very valuable storage in both Blue Lake and Lewis Lake. Um, and so that helps with the resiliency and how we operate the water system. And if there was ever an emergency, et cetera, there would be supplies in that, um, that raw supplies that a lot of uh, municipalities just don't have. It's just considered invaluable. So there's two things. Um, one, I talk about water efficiency, and then there's also water conservation. And so the water audit looks at mostly and measures water efficiency. So how much potable water do we produce? How much potable water is used? How do, like how much do we charge for a meter so we know it's being used? And then um, we back off into how much is considered losses. Leaks, sometimes we have known leaks. We test our system for leaks, but there's also sometimes water, we just don't know where it goes. Um, and the goal is in water efficiency to make those, those losses, the unknown water, be as small as possible. Um, and for some communities, the AWWA protocol talks about how much potable water is paid for to ensure the business is not losing money because 
a lot of a lot of municipalities and uh, private water suppliers look at that as a metric. So, um, as Scott indicated, uh, we've been looking at our water system. We've been metering for a lot of years. Um, this goes back to 2006. Uh, we have data, from, some data from 1989. So we can go back further, but the reliability of the data becomes uh, the data becomes less credible. Let's put it that way. So if you look over time, um, our water use has changed a great deal. In 2014, for whatever reason, the year that we decided to do our water um, our first water plan, uh, our water use was higher than it ever was. And if you look at that gray area, those are water losses. We have no idea where the water went. We know we produced it, but we don't know where all of it went. And if you look now at the far right in 2022, that's the smallest water loss, uh, amount of water loss we've ever seen. And um, for those of you who've had me, who listened to me before on this stuff, um, when we had from 2019 to 2020, you see that drop. Um, I was like, I'm not sure that's real, but I'm hoping it is. Um, and it stayed low. So it's real. What we attributed that um, improvement to in water efficiency was our metering at Mill Creek. We got a really good meter. We rely on it and it it's proving that it's it's it wasn't an anomaly. Uh, that it actually is giving us better data. Um, I am once again skeptical. I was like, wow, look at that drop, water losses. But we fixed so many leaks. And also with the boom in um, development and redevelopment, Public Works has been requiring uh, water service lines to be replaced, especially galvanized. Um, there are certain types of water service lines, the older you know, ones are leaking and you don't capture that because it's before the meter. So you just ended up, I think we ended up with um, a bunch of small leaks that we just couldn't account for. So I'm hoping that um, the gray area stays small once again. Um, if that's the case, I think we're, we may be as tight as we can be in water efficiency. Can I ask a quick question about that? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just not quite understanding. So when you see in previous years where there's greater water loss, when you say that you have a new meter, are you saying that that water loss wasn't actually there because it wasn't being measured properly or was, so it's not actual water loss necessarily? Right. Okay. So there's also, when they talk about water loss, it's what you know you've lost. They're the known leaks, uh -huh. the known you know, no leaks, problem. and then there's an awful lot you don't know. Okay. So it could be meter, meter reading inaccuracies. Okay. It could be, um, it be, and I don't think this happens frequently in our small water system, but people stealing water somehow. Um, so all those things you don't know, you just, just know that the water is not there, yeah. that okay. you haven't assigned it with the meter. So there's always metering inaccuracies on both sides of the use and production. And that can be figured in to these calculations. Um, we don't do enough testing of our meters to understand exactly um, what the inaccuracies are okay. at this time. But to be clear from what I was recalling from like 2015, 2016, when we got a report was there had been some determination on a few locales in town that had absolute issues with pipes and leakage. Right. So some of that loss was actually loss. And then as things have gotten fixed, it's also shrunk. It's not just because of the metering at Mill Creek. It's because of right. fixes. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. I have a quick question to kind of tag on to what Adrian has asked. Do these readings correlate with environmental issues like a high drought year versus a heavy rain year, or they're, they're completely separate from that? Um, you would think that it would correlate, but it does not. Does it? Yeah. So I like, think it. Because like 2014 was that year that we were surrounded by the fires and it was like raining ash. 
That's true, but we would have, had we had accurate meters, um, we would have seen an up, but I would have expected to see an increase in the orange line in 2014 okay. because we would have had authorized uses. However, um, what used to happen, there are also management things that happened in the day with, with that amount of drought, et cetera. I know that staff used to just have the still while tanks overflowing all during bluegrass in the in 4th of July, just in case it was necessary. Um, and that practice has gone away. So that could reflect some of it because that wouldn't have been metered. We just, and on the use end, it would have yeah. just been overflow. So I could see that that overflow would have continued maybe longer in 2014. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. This is good. That helps. It's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Is there another one? I think that's the end. No, I have two more, but I can't. There, I know. I had to move oh. the thing that should be. Oh, excellent. So we talked about, you know, the water audit is about efficiency. Um, how tightly are we operating and running our infrastructure in terms of water production, in terms of water use? Water conservation is also important, um, and we have the water conservation code for that when there are drought conditions, how can we um, cut back on the water we use? And we also have, um, so we have low fo flow fixture requirements in our code. We have landscaping requirements in our code, and those are being, um, you know, what was it, two years ago, there was a change to the landscaping ordinance under the Water Conservation Code. I believe um, Ecology Commission will be uh, recommending additional um, tightening of that ordinance and uh, along with updated guidelines for the landscaping. And there's also guidelines in the land use code for water landscaping. And that if you read that, it's fascinating. Um, Everybody reads the land use code all the time. Um, if you read that, it, it it's very broad saying, you know, native plants be use water conservation, use, you know, the best techniques possible to do appropriate landscaping in terms of water. Um, and as you know, there are additional act, actions if there's water shortages. And our current code doesn't necessarily say if there's a drought, um, water conservation kicks in. It says if there's a water supply problem, water conservation kicks in. But that's your discretion to say when these um, activities, uh, such as no car washing, don't put, you know, don't fill up glasses at, at restaurants uh, for water unless people ask, et cetera. Um, there's also the education and outreach portion of it. Turn off water when shaving or brushing your teeth. Uh, run only full loads of laundry uh, or full loads of dishes for dishwashers. Fix leaks promptly. Um, and very often our metering program helps with that. I know a lot of second homes, um, people who aren't having people or people in the buildings very often are getting more and more um, flow information to see if um, toilets running endlessly. It could use a lot, a lot of, of water. You wouldn't think so, but it can. And then, um, so even when it bypasses that, we get to the metering and people call um, finance and say, why do I have such a huge bill? Finance is like, we'll check the meter reading again. They send the meter reader out, they double check, and they're like, you need to check for leaks and get that fixed because it's a real number. And so they work individually with anyone on that. Um, and then just community discussions like we're having, um, like community discussions at the Ecology Commission level, you know, at the library or whatever, that we discuss what is the appropriate use of water in, in an arid and further warming and drier climate. Um, so two parts of the same um, water resource stewardship discussion. 
Um, do you have any additional questions? About those or the packet in general? Uh, just about the water audit. Well, <laughs> the water audit packet material in general. I was like, I don't think no, I can answer no. <laughs> the other stuff. Adrian, we'll start um, in the middle. Can, we, can you talk a little bit more about the meter replacement program? And you mentioned that it's kind of stalled a little bit in the last couple of years. And I guess I'm just trying to understand that in a little bit more detail why it has stalled and then how many you you mentioned that it's 40 percent of all metered accounts have new meters but 82 percent are less than 20 years old mm -hmm. the distinction there and why that matters or just say a little more okay about that whole thing. um so thinking years ago when i got first got my training was oh you know very old water meters at your house are not over time they get worn down the parts get worn down and they don't uh, read accurately. So you want to get a new one, um, a newer one. And so initially we were going, we had a program that would just go into, basically have the meter reader go into homes after making appointments with homeowners and changing out the oldest ones. Um, that just wasn't an efficient way to go about it. What ended up um, happening and still happens is when uh, meters uh, have batteries, and when those batteries go out, the meter gets replaced from an old census meter to a new Neptune meter. Um, and so that took place very rapidly with great enthusiasm, as with most programs, initially. Um, and then we've had a bunch of staff, staff changeover, and, um, and so the urgency of that program move to the back burner to take care of things breaking at the wastewater plant or the water plants, making sure things were operating. You know, we're back at full staff now. So I would hope that these, um, that the meters replacements would, you know, be ticked up again and we'll see. Um, I was initially kind of concerned that we were not meeting our hundred uh, meter quota. Um, at my last training for the water audits, the um, consultants for the state that do the outreach and, and help uh, municipalities at this, they have a they have a meter specialist, and he's like, "What we're finding is the age of the meter isn't as important as it once we thought it was," and so um, we're not as concerned if meters are older. And truth be told, if the data we just saw is correct that supports that to some degree, that it was more leaks than meter inaccuracies in the beginning. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Dan? So yeah, a number of questions for you quick, Karen. Um, going back to one of the first charts you showed with uh, the resiliency with the number of gallons we have in reserve at any one time between the different- If the, uh, all the one. tanks are full? Yeah, uh -huh. that one there. I did some quick math while looking at that uh with the storage the four water storage tanks that's about 1.45 million gallons um and then going off of in the memo a our average water use per person is about 50 gallons per day uh per person so the quick math that means we have about 29,000 persons of water in reserve on an ad, average base so that's about two days approximately in my mind for a number of tourists in town during one of our peak seasons. Does that feel sufficient to you? Uh, that does? Well, I mean, you're not, we don't produce water and let it sit there and then run the tanks down. Sure, of course. Yeah. Right, but if, let's say all our water treatments went down. Yeah, worst yeah. case, I'm talking worst case scenario. Here, all so. our water treatment went down, there was nothing new going into our storage tanks, yes. <clears throat> And that's why uh, our the water system in Blue Lake is so important. Sure, 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 sure. Um, one f we we generally say we get one fire out of our storage tanks. Like the, I think they went through the the um, Stillwell tanks for. I mean, they used about a million gallons of water for the BIT fire. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, if when that goes away, fire, the fire, you know, crew actually would go to the river and pump out of the river. 
Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Okay. Just was, I had never quite yeah. visioned it in that way before. And it's, it, it may be to me, my gut reaction was like, oh, wow, that doesn't seem too much, but I'm certainly not an expert. In that. For a, a municipality of our size, I think it is more, it is, it's pretty robust. Okay. Um, it also, I, um, yeah, I don't have the same expertise as someone who's, who does this, these calculations for a living. Sure, sure. Um, okay, moving on from that. Um, in the memo, it talked about new water services. Mm -hmm. um, can you clarify when it's a new water service, say for instance, the like Silverjack building, when we built that, does that count as just one new water service or do you count it individually per unit for something like that? I believe it's one service. It's, just one, it's service. one meter, yeah. yeah one meter. Okay, because I'm thinking about that as we have plans to build more mm -hmm. affordable housing and making sure that we are not excessively burdening beyond what we have. But based off of that, it seems we're still within the range we've operated in previous years based off of the plans we currently have. Mm -hmm. um, and yes. last, last question I have, and this is perhaps more for the rest of council, uh, going through the appendix uh, for the top water uses per year. One that I noticed as potentially low hanging fruit for us is the, the cemetery um, as that's in the top three generally. Top 10. Uh, top 10 easily, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, last couple of years it's been in the top three uh, and we've had success shifting the park to non-potable water. And that might be a way for us to alleviate one of the top users in our town from our water system would be switching the, the cemetery to that. Um, I don't know if Stephanie Jacque is on the call currently, but um, I would I don't know all the history of that switch when that happened. I wasn't around at the time. Uh, that the park, but the park's never has never irrigated with potable water. Parts parts of the pocket parks, et cetera, are potable water, but the big fields have always operated off of the two wells in in town park. Sure. Um, it is unclear whether that water could legally be used for the cemetery, not to mention pumping it uphill. Um, we Staff has been working with the cemetery since 2014. It was, you know, just as we worked with the school and part of the reasons, I mean, a great benefit of the artificial turf has been that that is no longer irrigated with potable water. Um, so that took them off the top, the top users list, the schools, but um, we've had less traction with the cemetery. They did a big revamp on the sprinkler system too recently, didn't they? They did because I thought Jeannie Goldberg came in here and was like, "We're installing a new sprinkler system. It's more wa water usage." Do you? Do, this was a real conversation, though. There were conversations. I don't know if staff is prepared today to speak to any of this, but there are conversations beginning. I know that. Yeah, we're continu continuing. We're continuing. Yeah. I think yeah, we're we've starting. been in, in continuous conversations. I know councils have spoken um, a variety of times with the cemetery board members as as you know as as we have tried to move forward different solutions as you pointed out ways to uh, decrease the use of potable water for irrigating seven acres of land um, and I think those will be continuing for yeah, sure. I mean, we just uh, and in fact uh, once this water report came out began having conversations again internally uh, about uh, sitting down with the cemetery board here um, this winter and really uh, putting together uh, a stronger plan moving forward for for them. It's it's water that is um, that they are not charged for, and, and the numbers are not necessarily going in the right direction as far as uh, quantity of, of use. So we want to help, and we want to uh, see that uh, again potable, uh, treated uh, irrigation. Uh, water go in in the uh, downward direction here uh, pretty robustly over the next few years, but that's going to take work with the cemetery board. And uh, again, we'd like to get them off of that uh, first, second, third highest user in in town. So um, it's on our radar, and we will be reaching out to them quite soon. Great, great. 
looking forward to more on that. I'm, and I'm sorry I lied. I actually have more questions. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, going to the chart of the water budget where the water losses decreases, that is fantastic. Very feel very good on that. The authorized consumption seems to have stayed fairly stable, seems to have not moved much at all which seems to sort of be the next target to potentially examine for us if we want to um, continue to be resilient and have the, the amount of water that we need. That seems to be the next needle that we want to move. And that's um, water conservation yeah, at okay. that point. Not resiliency, so thank you for correcting me. Um, because we, yeah, we've gone up some years, down, down some years, um, tied with, that um, with the in our municipal code for uh, our water conservation code with high efficiency fixtures that is in our code going back to the topic earlier of enforcement how well is that being enforced how are we enforcing that how do we monitor that is part of the plumbing code and so uh, inspections of new construction uh, that's the point of enforcement. So anybody can go in, and people do um, go in and say, I don't like this low flow shower head, and they change it. Yes. I think we've had tremendous success, though, with toilets. Um, in general, most people don't say, I want a huge tank, you know, the toilet with a tank. They're going for the slender, you know, modern look, and that's the one point, I think, two gallons now. Uh, and so you see, uh, I that would make up for per, potentially um, some of the losses when people change out their shower heads because they don't like them so much. Uh, but there's no there's no enforcement after a construction inspection. Do you okay? Uh, do you feel that that the authorized consumption is at a sustainable level with? The somewhat anticipated growth of our region do we feel like we are i that might be one better way for me to look at it is on a per person basis that has gone down because we have more people in town now than we did in 2007 when it peaked so that would probably be a better way for me to look at it i'm thinking out loud a little here excuse me. so there's there's two things um there's two ways to answer, I think, your question. I'm going to try to answer them both ways. One is our current water plan, complete with storage. We had um, a water resources study in 2010 that was related to build out of our water service area. At, at, and so it's not only town, but also Lawson and you know all of our service area. Um, and it's shifted a little bit, but not significantly until this year. So I'm going to hold off discussion about changes in water service area. But the development of the Pandora water treatment plan and that whole water source and getting all that was all recommended over years and years and years to meet our anticipated service area build out. Yep. Okay. And so... The other part of that is doing more with less or more with the same amount of resource. Um, I think that we've seen a tremendous increase. I'm not sure how to statistically talk about tremendous. We've seen an increase in um, persons in our valley for festivals and, and tourism. And, as, and that I think we're seeing more people based on our wastewater BOD numbers than we did back in the day, let's say even in 2010. But you've just noted that our water, authorized water use has remained steady. And so that indicates that our water conservation efforts with the low flow fixtures um, with better irrigation systems, just because, it, you know, it, 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 even though there are more irrigation systems, than there used to be, they're they're new and modern and such. I think that we're, I'm not, I don't at this point see concerns about us running out of water. 
and having enough water to supply the um, the community our water service area. That being said, I you know I have started having conversations with you know the new public works director and Kevin and and Scott about it's because we've changed or we've added to our water service area and our original water studies did not have climate change contingencies in them that it would be nice to to do a new build out for all of our water service full water service area and and answer those questions that you're asking um, with more confidence than I me going it seems like we're doing okay the trends are good so so look for that I would say in the next year or two there's no immediate we have to do this now we may be in trouble feeling. Sure. Yeah, great. Thank you. You're getting exactly to what I was trying to get to there. And um, it's a complicated issue, but it's, it seems like we're being well monitored and we have, you shared the goals that I have, Karen. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question since we called out the cemetery? Um, can you tell me what the San Juan warehouse building is and why that building? Well, I'll just leave it there and then I have follow up questions. It's the brewery. Uh, it's brewery. not just the brewery, oh. it's also the condos and side works. So yes, okay. we we believe they may have loot uh they may have leaks okay. somewhere. It's an older system, so we're we have them targeted to look at cool. and chat with and work together to figure out what's going on. Because it seems like a seven acre piece of land that is like a green space that is utilized by our community and has historical significance, like seems reasonable that they would use water to water that grass to a certain extent. But one commercial building having significant or more water use than even that space seems more concerning to me than the use of the cemetery, although they are both equally concerning with that. But I don't understand yeah. why a cemetery needs potable water. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's like a, a whole, whole thing, different. But deal. I'm also concerned about the use of one building in our town. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's a few others. There's some others. The AHA, I feel like, brings up some other questions with regard that I don't want to go down this road of like the fog stuff that you talked about. I'm curious if there's like arts related things going into our wastewater treatment, but that's for maybe next year. I don't feel like we have to belabor this. You know, and, and I, I'm grateful that you shared that because it's easy for staff to have those conversations more informally sure. to say, okay, what is going what's on, on and what systems are in place to, to kind of inform that. And then, you know, there may be a concern, there may not, we don't know. Yep. I'm a, I'd like to assume that, you know, it's a new system. They were very careful about the design of the AHA school and uh, all the anticipated arts projects. So I believe there are systems in okay. place for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thank you for this. I'm getting flashbacks to April 2020 as I was reading this. Oh, when we first passed this, and I was like, oh my God, remember that time? <laughs> um, <but> anyway, <laughs> thanks for going over it with us. Thanks, yeah. Karen. Oh, Geneva. Can I ask one? Just because uh, I'm curious, the wastewater treatment plant usage, I'm assuming that's like a dilute to get to the dilution is the solution sort of. It's for thing. washing so, down systems. We don't okay. dilute to, to meet our standards Okay. at all. But that's a reflection of what is coming in. It's not like you know, we're leaking water at the wastewater treatment plant. It's no, it's water process water to be used to keep mm -hmm. everything running smoothly, depending on just what's happening. Yes. Yes. Well, that's cool. That's been going down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. uh, I have a couple questions. One, um, you in, answered Dan's question about service, water service for this area. Um, what happens when someone's water rights, they call in their water rights that are older than ours, like Eurovan, and it's kind of a, we don't get all of the water that we're used to having. What do we do then? When there is a call on the West End for rights, there are only two rights that are older than some of our rights. Uh, so we are generally, our our water supply for domestic use is not impacted. Okay. Uh, we have a variety of water rights that are different ages, like, you know, that come in at different times. But 
when there is a call on the West End, the first thing they go to is uh, the diversion on Bear Creek to go to the kids fishing pond that gets turned off. And then the irrigation on the valley floor uh, tends to bit, get turned off. Um, and then we just shift what water rates we're using. If it, we've never had a call, however, that's gone very deep, hugely deep. But again, we're, I think there's only two other water rights in the entire watershed that are older than ours. And that's, a, again, a blessing for the town of Telluride and its ability to provide water um, for the water service area that we have. So we have water rights, we have water storage, and we have a variety of water treatment plants uh, from different watersheds. Um, so if there was, for example, we were recently talking about source water protection. Um, as we get more people in the Bridalville Basin and up to Blue Lake to visit, and, and, you know, or, or hiking in that high country, what are the risks? As we have helitrax flying up there for ski things, what is the risk? That was looked at uh, in 2016 for our um, source water protection. And so the risks, all of the risks um, at that time were assessed and considered. And one of the, um, I'd say that the essential tenets of the town's water system was if there is a catastrophic event in one of the watersheds that is man-caused, that there are other water sources and other water treatments uh, that can make sure the community still has water. So, um, so those are important things for you all to be aware of, I think, when you're thinking about water and water systems for the town. And my other question is, and I know Karen, you and I have talked about this briefly over the last several years, um, reverse osmosis. And do we need to start thinking about that when taking, utilizing, I guess it would be wastewater and turning it into drinking water is the best way to, to say it, right? Um, or the easiest way to say it. I'm um, just trying to prepare our community for worst case scenario um, with available water. Unlike uh, areas where you see reverse osmosis or desalinization even of, you know, of aquifers, um, the town isn't in that position. We're not water short. Um, that being said also, our water rights don't allow, most of our water rights do not allow us to um, continuously use this water. We have to send it downstream. So um, there would be a very small amount of water um, that I can't speak to at this moment, but I have spoken to our, you know, years ago with our water attorneys to ask about, could we use some of our wastewater discharge to, let's say, irrigate? of the, the landscaping around the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and they were like, yeah, kind of um, at that point. Um, reverse osmosis is wildly expensive. Um, and so I think that at this point, well, it, it's something that might be required uh, at our wastewater plant for other reasons. Uh, then water shortages for potable water. Um, given all of the capital needs of our region and community, that's something that would not likely be embarked on for budgetary reasons unless there was a real huge need. And that's, that's I, I would say that's well down the road. Maybe you'll be my age at that point. Or older part. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any My pleasure. questions? Comments from staff? I was just going to make one comment, Mayor, to follow up, I think, on the question from Jesse Ray about calls. I don't think we've ever had a call on Mill Creek direct flow for the water treatment plant. We have for the irrigation uses that occur downstream on Mill Creek. And that's a direct flow. So that, and that's 
that's separate from what we have up in Bridal Vale, which is reservoir capacity, which is not subject to similar calls on the river. So the town's very fortunate. I think you all know that. If you don't, let me reiterate it again. We are very, very fortunate to have, number one, so many senior water rights, and then in such a large quantity as well. Uh, we've also implemented what's called an exchange plan, which allows the town to move basically seamless from Mill Creek to Pandora, to any of our other water rights that we would want to use without having to necessarily, um, they're all considered one accounting, if you will. So they're all under a similar decree that was, took many years to get through, but now is 20 years old and the decree and the water rights date back to the early 1900s, which is, as Karen said, some of the most senior water in the basin. The town's very lucky. We have other, other elements that now require attention and this did get a lot of attention 20 years ago, 10 years ago when Pandora was constructed. And we're still paying on some of the bonds for that. But so. We're lucky with that doesn't mean you guys get to use as much water as you want to whenever you want to. <laughs> and I think we've done a pretty good job on that. I think those, the authorized use numbers really, I think reflect as someone else observed, we're having more visitation in the Valley and yet it appears we're staying fairly stable. And we've also added for instance, new affordable housing units and uh, homes have been renovated to have more fixtures and more bathrooms. And yet our authorized use seems to be about static. That's somewhat unusual. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other hands go up. Is this about what we're currently discussing? Very much. Um, are we prepared to do the second part of the manager's report after lunch? I can do that after lunch. It's, uh, yeah, it's somewhat lengthy. So if we've got some yeah. comments you'd like to take, Mary, let's, let's. So if up. anybody is listening and waiting for our discussion on sandwich boards and the Hickox rule, which technically are two separate things, and you will hear more about that later, um, please do tune in later today. Sorry, we're going to push that. Um, if you could please come up to the microphone and introduce yourself for the record. Yes, I'm Eric Jacobson, who was intimately involved with Bridalville for many years, and I have a few questions for Ms. Karen. Um, years ago, when the uh, diversion was put on the top of Bridalville, that uh, the Falls Crest diversion, the question was, uh, what's going to happen to Black Swift nesting the second biggest population of nesting black swifts in Colorado and also a state species of concern. Uh, you assured us six years ago that nesting would be monitored. Uh, a, is nesting being monitored? D, what documentation do you have that the city has been maintaining minimum stream flow over Bridalville Falls, which is a visible attribute of the town and secondly, is crit critically important to those black slips. I'm, I'm going to clarify that I did never said that the town would continue to monitor black swifts indefinitely. Um, I think that your concerns had to, mostly to do with the construction up there. Um, and We don't have any official documentation that has been provided to the town uh, that verifies that this is the second largest black swift population at all. Um, so that being said, um, I have no, the town has no documentation about the black swifts whatsoever. Um, the next question you had about the one CFS over the falls, um, there is a requirement that if uh, the falls is, um, well, if flows in Bridalvale Creek uh, get near or a certain level that we don't directly divert out of the falls crest diversion in order to keep at least one CFS going over the falls, um, that is done visually, um, and the falls have not run dry, and we have, uh, when the flows get very low, 
uh, our staff are directed to uh, ensure that the valves are off at the False Crest diversion. Uh, um, and you had a third question. Well, actually, so just just one sec, just one second, please, because usually we take public comment and we don't go into a question and answer session. And to be oh. fair to the rest of the general public, historically. I'm wondering if this might be a better conversation to be had with staff and the public. Um, and I'm just trying to be equitable to how I treat all public comment. It's okay. nothing against this, the questions or the situation. I'd kind of like to, happy hear, to hear the comments publicly, but perhaps not a back and forth with staff. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just. Okay, yeah, that would be great. And not Perfect. Back and, forth then. Okay, and maybe a, then staff can work on answering them for you. A black swift uh hard monitoring of the one cfs minimum mm -hmm. stream flow number two uh the uh peggy lyons uh transect uh, indicated that rattlevale basin was one of the only noxious weed free areas in colorado what's being done to maintain the noxious free uh uh weed situation up there as far as construction equipment and everything else my third question was uh, in 2016, Karen was very involved with uh, the Bridalville power plant uh, ceasing operation. Uh, is the cost per year to Iderado for it not running still being made? What is the city doing about carbon offsets for the second largest green power producer in the San Miguel uh, power system not being running? Uh, the third one is the uh, Oak Creek pump. Uh, we've got the infamous dollar a year deal for Blue Lake water to feed the Oak Creek Oak Street pumps for the ski area. Is the ski area committing anything more than a dollar a year for the city providing uh, snow making? And uh, four is the Lewis pipeline working. Uh, and uh, if you want me to, I'll answer Jesse Ray's because I think the Lewis hasn't worked since the city took over and tell you how the water commissioner does the call. I'll just respond on that one real quick because it does involve some legal issues. Lewis has been used. The Lewis line has been used as most recently as last summer to refill Blue Lake. So your information is incorrect on that. Um, some of the other questions I think we can respond to and, and probably better to do it outside of the context of this meeting. I usually try to type out, even in my shorthand, all the questions to make sure that they are ultimately answered in some way. Um, but you were going pretty quick, so I didn't catch them all, but it is in the recording so we can have staff recapture those. Um, and please do, well, I'm going to let staff do that because I know I don't have the expertise on answers for these questions. And that's definitely three minutes for public comment. Yeah, you can you can go ahead and email your these questions to uh, town manager's office s robson at telluride.co.us and we will be glad to get back to you on some of those details. Very good. But it's not really not a Q and A session. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Thanks, Eric. Okay, we are at eleven fifty four. I would prefer not to start on the Hickox rule and the sandwich boards because it is a lengthy topic. So we will break at 11.55 for lunch and we will come back at one o'clock with public comment and then start the rest of our agenda.
Hello, everybody. We are back. It is 1.01 p.m. And this is the Telluride Town Council meeting of March 7th, 2023. Present after lunch in council chambers are still the entirety of council. Yay, us. And for the next item on our agenda, <clears throat> pardon me, we are in number three, public comment. Let me find my message announcements. This is for public comment on items that are not otherwise on our agenda. Public comment is now open, but with a five minute maximum per person and our overall duration for public comment will not exceed 45 minutes per council meeting. Civility is expected between council and the public and among members of the public while in meetings. Rude behavior will not be tolerated. All participants in council meetings are to refrain from the use of profanity along with no personal attacks or personal arguments. If you are in the room and would like to make public comment, as I just described, please raise your hand. And if you are online, please raise your hand. For right now, I see one hand up and our clerk has just put the timer there so you can keep track of it yourself. Could you please unmute? Judy Haas. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you all for all the work you do. It's just incredible listening to these town council meetings because there's so much going on in our town. So thank you. Um, I missed the last 15 minutes of this morning's um, meeting. And I'm wondering, did you discuss the Hickok and the sandwich board rule? Um, we did not. We actually ran out of time, and we are going to revisit that under administrative reports this afternoon. Okay. Um, well, then I'll just make my public, public comment very quickly that I hope that you will allow for the um, sandwich boards in town, because I think they're a really important part of the way that our businesses in town do business and attract people into their stores. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other folks on who would like to make public comment during this general public comment section? <clears throat> I am not seeing any hands go up. So I'm going to go ahead and move into the next item on our agenda and close public comment. Right, let me get to the right place. <laughs> Item number four is presentations and proclamations. 4A is presentation of a service medallion to Susie St. Ange for her 11 years of service on the Open Space Commission. Dear Susie, on behalf of the town of Telluride and the Telluride Town Council, it is with sincere gratitude that we present this letter and medallion to you in appreciation of your more than 10 years of service on the Telluride Open Space Commission from 2012 through 2023. As a member of the San Miguel County Open Space Commission, your contributions have been integral in this crossover member position. Your dedication to the preservation of our protected and beloved open space is evident. Your professionalism, dependability, and willingness to be a public servant have been a welcome addition to our Open Space Commission all these years, and you will be missed. We want to extend our warmest thanks and best wishes to you. Please accept this token of appreciation for your service to the community. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, wow. The lady and Susie look this way. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to look at someone. Yay. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Can we say a few things? 
Please make sense. <laughs> World. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all of you guys because I know how much time you put in and how much reading you do and how many detail you've got. Telluride's been my town, even though I live in South Bend. It's been my town for 50 years. And um, I just really think it's awesome how much time you put in. Um, pull out my notes here. <laughs> um, I'm really happy to have served the town of Telluride on the Open Space Commission, and especially as a crossover report, because I think it was really fun to uh, grease some wheels and make some cooperative projects happen. Um, it was a steep learning curve in the beginning, but Lance made it fun and and uh, helped me understand some basic things like the environmental plan informs the management plan, which informs the monitoring plan, which informs our work plan, which... <laughs> And I kept coming back to that and realizing it's just such a, a well-oiled machine. And Lance does an excellent job as director. And Angela does an awesome job as chair. And it's just such a great group. I feel like it's a good time to, to move on. I'm, I'm chairman of uh, County Open Space and also Town of Sot Pit PNZ. And there, I think uh, both of those commissions need me um, a little more right now. And I'm ready to Kind of let this go, even though it's hard because it's a really fun position. I hope we can find somebody else to fill it. Um, I just want to put in a word for open space funding in this next little bit because we do have projects and things to consider and that um, give a good hunk of money to open space as you continue to find the other needs that that money is for. Thank you so much for this. It's just awesome. <laughs> Next on our agenda, item 4B is going to be continued to our March 28th meeting because we want to introduce people when they are able to be with us. And item 4C is introduction of new community housing manager, James Van Hooser. And we have Kermit the dog in the house with us. Well, Scott. All right. Thank you, Mayor. We are so excited to uh, uh, welcome James Van Hoosier as the uh, newest member of the Town of Telluride staff team in a new role uh, that we're calling Community Housing Manager to really reflect the priority of uh, continuing to uh, develop and uh, collaborate on more community housing in, in this uh, town. And we are so lucky to have a, a guy like James who, um, you know, his, his, uh, DNA seems to be built on uh, housing policy, um, housing innovation, and uh, served for the town of Telluride for about seven years uh, before um, he, he took mm -hmm. his uh, skills to the city of Denver for a number, uh, a couple of years uh, to really work on some big city um, urban housing issues. Uh, but we're so pleased um, uh, to uh, bring him back to the town of Telluride. Um, last uh, couple of years, James has been serving as the deputy county manager uh, for San Miguel County. So um, I think he's a great representation of just the level of quality and, uh, but also local, uh, you know, local spirit that we are trying to bring into the town of Telluride position by position. So we're so happy to have you here. James, we're really looking to uh, continue to press the gas on uh, uh, innovative and high quality community housing. And with your help, we're gonna do that. So um, James is teaming up with Lance McDonald, our longtime program director, and uh, between the two of them and uh, work here out of the uh, town manager's office, uh, really looking forward to continuing to make big progress on some of our community's most important projects. So James, I'll hand it back to you. Just uh, really pleased to have you here. Thanks, Scott. Missed y'all. <laughs> Good to be home. Um, yeah, excited to get back to work. Already hit the ground running with uh, meeting with Lance all day, every day for the last four days, which, you know, I know how to do. So uh, it's been great. And um, big thanks to Scott. Uh, also, big thanks to Mike Bordonia, accounting manager, for bringing me back to the area um, last year. Um, West Slope, Best Slope, uh, just happy to Happy to be back. So thanks. Welcome home. Hey, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Awesome. <laughs> Next on the agenda is appointments to boards and commissions. 5A is the reading of the boards and commissions vacancies. These are the current board openings. 
The Telluride Town Council is accepting applications for current and upcoming vacancies from citizens interested in volunteering their service on one or more of the following towns, boards, committees, or commissions. Applications must be received by noon on Monday, March 20th, 2023, for possible consideration at the next town council meeting of March 28th, 2023. And just a reminder, if you need more information about any of these boards and commissions, you can find it on our website. I'm simply going to read the title of each board and what is available. The Board of Adjustment and Appeals has five regular seats and two alternate seats for one or two year terms. These people must be qualified electors and residents of the town of Telluride. The Community for Assistance Arts and Special Events, otherwise known as CASE or C-CASE, has one regular seat for a one or two year term. That person could be a town or county elector and that seat is being considered today. The Ethics Commission has one regular seat for a one or two year term. That person must be a town elector. The Open Space Commission has one regular seat for a one or two year term and that person must be a San Miguel County crossover member. Um, that was the award we just gave or granted you know, token of gratitude to Susie St. Ange, St. Miguel County crossover member. <clears throat> Planning and Zoning Commission has one alternate seat for a one or two year term. That person must be a town elector for at least one year prior to applying. The Public Art Commission has one regular seat for a one or two year term. That person must have been a town elector for at least six months prior to application. And the Telluride Regional Airport Authority has one public at-large seat for a four-year term. That person must be a town elector. Please note that town council may choose to appoint a sitting alternate to a regular seat vacancy. Should that occur, council reserves the right to appoint any applicant to an alternate position. <laughs> Item number 5B is Commission for Community Assistance, Arts, and Special Events. One regular seat for a one or two-year term. I believe we have we had two applicants, but one of them has withdrawn their application. So we have one applicant and Clerk Miller will help us with this item. Yes, like you said, we did have two applicants. Um, the other applicant has withdrawn her application at this time, uh, but hopes to apply again later down the road. So the applicant uh, for this position is Sasha Cuccinello. Hope I pronounced that correctly. She has served on case since January of 2010. Her attendance is listed in your packet and um, it is recommended that council review the application and um, appoint for a seat of, or for a term of one or two years beginning immediately. And I believe that she is here with us to speak on her behalf. Would you like to say anything? If you would come up to the mic, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I would like to continue to serve on case. I think that um, we have a bunch of new members, so it's important to have, as Stephanie calls it, the historical knowledge that I hold, um, which was Ron Gilmer before me. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do in the upcoming year with the feedback that we've received about our application and our process and everything. So I'd really like to see that through and help um, iron out some issues that we had this year and um, you know, see, see the commission grow and uh, move into the future. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you for your consideration. <laughs> and Sasha has served, I'm, not, I'm speaking as the case liaison from council. Sasha has served as chair for, I think the entirety of the time I have served on case and holy cow, can she run a great meeting. So above all the other historical knowledge, it's um, really a pleasure to have her being the chair of CASE. So if there are any questions or comments for staff or the applicant, Dan? Not for the applicant, but for the applicant who withdrew their nomination. Jeannie Walker, if you're listening, thanks for your application. Please apply for other things and I will reach out to you to get you to be more involved because you are a valuable community member. And to anyone else listening, we have vacancies as the mayor just said, please get involved in your community, give back, thank you. Thanks, Dan. And CASE is one of those boards that's kind of hard to get onto. People like serving on this board. 
And one of our current members applied three times within a, I don't know, six to seven month period and finally was able to get on. So if there's a board you specifically want to serve on, just keep trying. So I echo what Dan just said. I move to approve the application for Sasha Cuccinello, the incumbent for community commission for community assistance, arts and special events for a two year term effective immediately. Second. I have a motion from Jesse Ray and a second from Mian is what I heard. Anything further? Jesse Ray, how do you vote? Jesse Ray, yes. Mian, yes. Dan, yes. Adrian, yes. Geneva, yes. Lars, yes. Delaney, yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, Thank Sasha. Thanks, Sasha. Sticking with us. <laughs> okay. We are moving into the consent calendar. Item number six, 6A is approval of minutes from our regular meeting of February 14th, 2023. Any comments or questions from the consent calendar from anyone? I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. Yes, you're a yes. Adrian, yes, sorry. Dan, yes. Dan, yes. Geneva, yes. Lars, yes. Delaney, yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And moving into, what time is it? 117, no, it's at 110. We are good. Okay. Item number seven, public hearing. 7A is second reading and approval of an ordinance of the Town Council of the Town of Telluride, Colorado, amending the Telluride Municipal Code at Chapter 18 Land Use Code, within Article 3, Zone District Regulations, Article 5, Development Review Procedures, Article 6, Land Use and Development Applications, and Article 7, Historic and Architectural Review for the purpose of establishing new requirements for public hearing and meeting notices. Planning Director Ron Quarles will help us with this item. Thank you, Mayor Young, <clears throat> Town Council. This, this is an item that you looked at uh, at your last meeting and approved on first reading. This is a, a public hearing, it's second reading for the ordinance. Um, so the purpose of the ordinance is really, it's pretty simple. It's um, what we're trying to do is establish clarity to the public notice procedures. Um, Three, three primary changes, standard, standardization of noticing deadlines, creation of a new framework for noticing levels, and a simplified renumbering of code references and citations. Um, we've created a new, easier format for this uh, section of the land use code. Right now, it's, it's difficult to navigate uh, notice requirements based on the format. We've established a simple format, 5-204A, notice required, the manner of notice, newspaper publication, mailing of notice, posting of a sign, uh, website publication notice. And then we've created new levels of notice based on um, which items require a notice. And the content of the notice, which was already in the in the existing code, but we've made it easier to navigate to that section. Uh, affidavit required, and then the adequacy of notice. So we've created four levels of notice. Um, generally, the level one requ is required for minor minor scale activities. Uh, level two for land use code amendments. Level three generally large and small scale activities, and level four uh, uses permitted on review, variances, PUDs, subdivisions. Uh, level four is primarily the land use um, section of the land use code. Uh, level one requires a sign posting and a town website notice. Level two, newspaper notice, town website, level three, um, sign posting, town website, and a mail notice, and then level four, all of the above. Um, and then finally, we created um, a standard uh, requirement prior to public hearings. The notices uh, would have to be uh, 
accomplished 15 days prior to the hearings. Currently, our code requires 10 day notices for some for some notice procedures and 15 days for others. Uh, we always had difficulty uh, administering that or making sure that we we didn't um, miss the deadlines or accomplish the deadlines in the, in the uh, requirements. Notice for, or the affidavit of notice is now required 10 days prior to the public hearing rather than five days. And with that, that's my presentation. That's basically the changes that we're making. Um, Planning and Zoning Commission and HARC reviewed these uh, changes. Um, both recommended approval with no changes to the uh, format of the, of the ordinance. And I'll answer any questions. Thanks, Ron. Questions or comments for staff? We had a rather thorough presentation last time. Thank you. I guess just like the biggest concern that we all had was making sure that there was a variety of ways that this information could be disseminated. So like, even though the ordinance is reading the same, staff is aware that council's concern was yes. information dissemination. Yes, and we we have um, Jonna, Lindsay, myself, and Tammy have met, and we're already uh, focusing our efforts on accomplishing that, making sure that we check all the boxes, that it's easily accessible, it's uh, sustainable, uh, all of the all of the things all that we discussed. Perfect. Thank you. This is a public hearing, and I'm going to go ahead and go to public comment and try to draw it out in case anybody on Zoom wants to raise their hand to make public comment on item 7A, which would be, it is consideration and potential approval of an ordinance to our code for how things are noticed for public process for planning and zoning and HARC items. So if anybody would like to raise their hand, I will call on you for public comment. I think I dragged that out pretty well and I am not seeing any hands go up. So I'm going to close public comment on this item and bring it back up to council. Any lingering comments or questions from council? Anything to add from staff? Okay. I move to approve on second reading an ordinance of the town council of the town of Telluride, Colorado, amending the Telluride Municipal Code at chapter 18, the land use code within article three, zone district regulations, article five, development review procedures, article six, land use and development applications, and article seven, historic and architectural review for the purpose of establishing new requirements for public hearing and meeting, meeting notices. I second. I have a motion from Jesse Ray and a second from Dan, Kevin, or Tiffany. I noticed, or Piper, I noticed a hand go up as soon as the motion started to be made. Should I go ahead and entertain this public comment even though I closed it? Yeah, I think you can and you should. Okay, thank you. If you could set the timer, Piper, mm -hmm. and please unmute Mr. Tooley. Uh, yes, thank you. I was listening on the radio. It took me a second to, to get logged in. Um, uh, I'd like to testify in, in support of this and just briefly, if I may, a couple of anecdotal uh, uh, stories to my qualifications to do so. Um, I worked on the digital zoning uh, for the King County, the greater Seattle uh, County, uh, primarily the unincorporated areas, all of the unincorporated areas in King County. Uh, as the lead on a, a three-person team at that point in my career. Um, I had uh, also been active in community politics in the city of Seattle, the incorporated city of Seattle, and had always tuned out whenever the people were talking about it. Never made it. But did get a presentation from a qualified um, uh, code enforcement person, a code person, Albert Bautista, with King County. And everything started to make sense then, including um, a lot of stuff, including what was going on. Uh, secondly, um, I'd like to thank James Van Hoosier going with his qualifications um, as part of the, the town team. Uh, I had the opportunity to have him present to me um, the uh, town zoning, just using the map that's there on the county, uh, on the counter, at the, at the, um, uh, the building department. Very helpful. So, all good. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. 
I did not see any other hands go up for public comment, so I am going to reclose public comment and bring it back up. There is a motion on the table for approval as stated in our memo packet. Uh, motion from Jesse Ray, second from Dan. Anything else? Jesse Ray, how do you vote? Jesse Ray, yes. Dan, yes. Ian, yes. Adrian, yes. Geneva, yes. Large, yes. Blaine, yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, staff and planning and zoning and HARC for getting this to us. Okay. Item number 7B, second reading and approval of an ordinance of the Town Council of the Town of Telluride, Colorado, amending Telluride Municipal Code, Chapter 2, Article 1, Elections, Section 2-1-20, Withdrawal from Nomination, Section 2-1-30, Write-in Votes, Section 2-1-40, Absentee slash Mail-in Ballots, Section 2-1-50, Provisional Ballots, Section 2-1-60, Cancellation of Elections, Section 2-1-70, Alien Registration Lists, Section 2-1-80, Watchers, Section 2-1-90, Nonpartisan Issue Petitions and Nominating Petitions, Section 2-1-110, Political Signs, and adding a new Section 2-1-100, Municipal Campaign Finance, and we have Clerk Kavanaugh to help us with this item. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. And so these changes before you today are proposed to align our municipal code with the Title 31 State Election Code. Um, the R code was last amended in 2021 after the election when the electorate approved some charter amendments, some sections of the charter to be moved into our municipal code. They were just moved as is. And no other changes were made to the section of the code at that time. Uh, previous to that, the last time our code was amended in 2011, and there has been significant changes to the state election code since 2011. One of the main ones being that um, Colorado became an all mail ballot state in 2013. So you'll see that a lot of our language in our code reflects um, prior to Colorado becoming a mail ballot state. So the changes uh, before you today are to just align that with Title 31 and then to add some clarifying language to our code and then to add that new section on municipal and campaign finance. We have always um, abided by the Fair Campaign Practices Act, but there's some um, additional restrictions that were placed into our code and as a home rule authority, you have that power. So those being limiting contributions to candidates and candidate committees and political committees to $400. So that would be now in our code once you adopt this. And a work session uh, was held on January 31st where I went line by line on the proposed red line. It was pretty in depth. First reading was held on February 14th and there have been no changes to the code since the first reading. So it is before you today for a second reading and approval at the public hearings. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Tiffany. Questions or comments on this item? The one comment just for clarity is that no candidate can receive an individual donation of $400, uh, but they can cumulatively accept more than that from different um, con contributors. Correct. Correct, but not aggregate from one person. So yes. one person can do $400 total, but yes, that's correct. Um, multiple individuals can donate maximum $400. Yes. Okay. And then um, I shall clarify that uh, this doesn't limit the candidate's self contributions to the campaign. So the candidate can contribute as much as they want. Anything else? And just um, out of curiosity, was staff still able to occasionally work on the other question that had come up as far as outside of this limitation on campaign contributions to other committees? Um, are you We're still, still working on it? Yes, we okay. don't have an answer on that yet. Okay. But it is on our radar. Okay. 
I'm not seeing anything else up here from the council level or staff level. This is also a public hearing. And if someone would like to raise their hand, we will call on you. I'll give it a couple extra seconds this time as um, was evidenced before. If you're listening on the radio, it may take you a moment to log into Zoom and raise your hand. This is for item 7B on our agenda of March 7th in regards to an ordinance for the Telluride Municipal Code Chapter 2, Article 1, Elections. If you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. And I'm not seeing any hands go up, so I am going to close public comment on item 7B and bring it back up to council. And if there is nothing further, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve on second reading after a public hearing and ordinance of the Town Council of the Town of Telluride, Colorado, amending the Telluride Municipal Code, Chapter 2, Article 1, Election, Section 2-1-20, Withdrawal from Nomination, Section 2-1-30, Write-in Votes, Section 2-1-40, Absentee slash mail-in ballots, Section 2-1-50, Provisional Ballots, Section 2-1-60, Cancellation of Election, Section 2-1-70, Alien registration lists, 2 1 80 watchers, 2 1 90 nonpartisan issue petitions and nominating petitions, section 2 1 110 political signs, and adding a new section 2 1 100 municipal campaign finance. I second. We have a motion from Jesse Ray and a second from Dan. Anything further? Jesse Ray, how do you vote? Jesse Ray, yes. Dan, yes. Man, yes. Adrian, yes. Andy, yes. Large, yes. Blaney, yes. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks, so. Item number eight, action items. 8A is, I'm going to take a sip of water. It's a long one. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> Introduction and first reading of an ordinance of the Town Council of the Town of Telluride, Colorado, amending the Town of Telluride Municipal Code at Chapter 4, Revenue and Finance, within Section 4-6-140, Approvals, Section 4-6-150, Formal Contract Procedure, Section 4-6-220, Competitive Sealed Bidding, Section 4-6-230, Competitive Sealed Proposal, Section 4-6-240, small purchases. Section 4-6-250, miscellaneous exemptions. Section 4-6-260, emergency procurement. Section 4-6-270, state, federal, or CML bid. For the purpose of adjusting the dollar amounts threshold for formal contract procurement, professional services, department and town manager approval, and updating exemptions to include cooperative groups. We have Attorney Geiger and Public Works Director Beck to help us with this item. Kyle, do you wanna go first? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, well, Council, uh, Mayor, Kyle Beck, Public Works Director. Sorry, Kyle, to interrupt you. Can you, we've got a feedback on there a little bit. You might have to turn down your audio on that a little bit or put in headphones if you have them. Is that any better? No, but it's fine. I, we can understand you. Sorry to interrupt. No, I, I apologize. Um, I was going to try to make it there. Just finished up with uh, an interview, so I didn't want to leave uh, Kevin hanging. So uh, my apologies for not being there, but I appreciate you letting me join in remotely. Um, as we discussed in the last council meeting on uh, February 14th, just discussing some of the changes to the procurement code, uh, in regards to some minimal threshold and some number of adjustments that I was hoping uh, to entertain to help ease some of the, uh, the, the proposal process that I'm going through right now. Uh, a lot of sections there mentioned in the, the beginning, but it all really ties into a few just uh, numbers that I'd like to see changed to assist during the cooperative bid process. Um, the first section um, actually has to do with just any, any purchases that is done under the division, this is not only with just the public works department, but other departments, and really help out the town manager with the number of pur uh, purchase services that have to be approved in process 
It'd, it'd be changing the minimum threshold to two thousand dollars for town manager to prove and bump that up uh, that number up to five thousand. Um, I just feel like I've been bombarding um, Scott with a lot of these purchases, which are um, they're not small, but they're they're necessary for material purchases. Um, anything that we buy at Public Works to be large quantity, higher price, so that it just would help uh, minimize. Um, the amount of purchase orders in the uh, folder and help efficiency within the department. And then on a bigger note, we need to be changing the minimum threshold for the cooperative bid um, price, which historically has been 50,000, which is set for approximately, has been set for that for about 20 years, bumping that up to 75,000. That will help minimize the amount of um, um, invitations to bid and uh, um, other, other other purchasing items, it would assist with the number of those smartphone bids you have to allow um, to like bid it at, or even just close to the newspaper. Currently, I think I have, uh, I have eight that are out there right now. Um, every single vehicle that we have to purchase um, is, is falling above that fifty thousand dollars threshold. So this would help eliminate uh, having to go to bid for every single vehicle, which would help consistency with the department and keeping. Um, all the or having similar vehicles to minimize the effort for the fleet department and having to carry all the different parts of the vehicles as well. Um, it also goes along with construction, um, materials, um, supplies, uh, anything under 75,000 would be done at the department level. And then anything above 75,000 would have to go to that cooperative bid purchase, or uh, we could uh, utilize as many exemptions. That are listed in the current list in the current code, but also um, one of the changes we're recommending is allowing the cooperative the bidding group, as discussed on February 14th, um, to be an exemption uh, to the competitive bid. The cooperative bidding group is a local government that also does the same formal competitive bidding process, so it's really just piggybacking on the processes that we already have in place. Um, the other uh, addition uh, change to the procurement code would be adding an email uh, for those who want to submit their bid to email uh, versus hand delivered mail or fax. And it's just adding that into an option to be able to um, submit a formal bid uh, for something that would be over that $65,000 threshold. So uh, lots of uh, changes to a lot of the uh, sections, but they're all similar in nature. So, so with, with that, that um, did you know, Kevin, if you wanted to add anything to the procurement code changes, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Kyle. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. So this is Kevin Geiger, and I'll just follow Mr. Beck briefly on this. Just to mention for the record, the memo on this is found at page 106 in that memorandum. We do detail and provide some of the subcategories that Mr. Beck just went over, the four in particular that were reviewed. The actual ordinance is provided in your packet materials at page 109. In the ordinance, you'll see that the language is actually drafted with underlining uh, provisions indicating new additions and then strike throughs indicating deletions. As Mr. Beck indicated, uh, the four categories basically are moving the threshold for town manager approval from $2,000 to $5,000 amending the threshold for competitive bidding from $50,000 to $75,000, allowing email as another means of communicating a bid to the town. Right now, it's either by mail, physical, or facsimile. Uh, the one thing we'll have to think a little bit about on email is sometimes you have a bid opening, most times you have a bid opening, you can't open the bid until a certain period of time. So we'll have to be a little bit cognizant when an email comes in, but we're this, we do the same on facsimiles. If we get a facsimile for a bid, you receive it, you don't actually look at the content of it, you log it as received by a certain date, but you don't actually open it or review it until that other uh, applicable date for the bid opening. And then following uh, the three that I've just mentioned is the cooperative purchasing exemption that Mr. Beck indicated. That was really the impetus, I think, for this whole uh, first consideration of this at the work session. And then you'll recall council directed that we look at increasing the threshold for competitive bidding and the staff recommendation was moving that from 50 to 75. And then upon examination of the code, I think it was Public Works um, recommendation that the other two provisions that we briefly discussed, that they also receive an amendment as well. So it's rather a straightforward amendment. This is first reading. 
uh, we would bring it back for second reading should it seek your approval at your March 28th meeting. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Kyle and Kevin. Questions? Mayor, I would just add that um, I've worked with staff on this, particularly Kyle uh, Beck and uh, Kevin and team, and uh, I'm certainly supportive. I think these are pragmatic changes. Um, you know, during any given week, I'm, I'm signing several dozen uh, purchase orders. A lot of them are in that $2,000, $3,000 ballpark. So it is hard to make almost any purchase nowadays of um, supplies, equipment that's um, that's under 5,000. So I think this would take a little bit of workload off. It's uh, unnecessary. And again, um, at that $75,000 threshold, I think that's a, a good one. Hasn't been changed in 20 years. And again, um, I would say that being able to tap into some of our state bidding processes and, and cooperative bids as we as we look towards uh, public works vehicles, any any fleet vehicles, uh, again, just a very pragmatic change, I think, to stay with the times and increase our efficiency a little bit. Thank you, Scott. This just seems like a great, great move all around. Yeah, I was a little surprised that you didn't increase the five thousand or the two thousand to five thousand or seventy fifty to seventy five a little bit more. Just like a quick Google of fifty thousand dollars in two thousand money is is eighty eight thousand dollars, and you mentioned like the inflation has a justification for the dollar amount, but um, I just considering that it hasn't been updated in 20 years that like perhaps maybe those numbers could be bigger, but if that's what you all feel comfortable with, then we'll obviously go with your direction. So, um, and I think and it then, makes sense to put it up to a hundred just cause you're, you know, get there in a couple of years anyway. Right. That's kind of where I was going. I think with we it. just, we just want to start a little conservative. If, if council's feeling comfortable at a higher value, I think that's good math that uh, some research that you just did, I would be comfortable with that as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm comfortable with the higher number. Me, me too. And did we, we want to increase the 5,000 anymore? I, I didn't do my calculation on that. <laughs> I think I'm fine with 5,000. Again, it, it kind of lands on my desk. If it's uh, as a purchase order, uh, anything over that now, um, I, I do like to obviously put my eyes on as many orders uh, and purchases as possible. Um, but I think that's a good number uh, as far as cutting down some workload, but keeping the big stuff on my radar. Okay. And then my final question was, do you actually get faxes? Like <laughs> as we're editing the code, like should we remove fax in general? But if you'd rather keep it, that's fine too. I was just curious. <laughs> Me too. I can't tell you if we've received a bid recently via facsimile, but- um, Do we have a fax machine? We do. Okay. <laughs> and I Part still have to use it every once in a while. Okay, that's fine. I just- um, and a typewriter, right next to the typewriter. I use a typewriter too. Yeah. <laughs> I will, I will does, this, does it still make that awesome sound? sound? It does. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we, we could clean it up by taking it out. I think it's usually better to keep it in until that technology is completely kind of obsolete. Maybe it's mostly obsolete. Um, and on your question about going from 50 to 88 to a hundred, we're at your, at your pleasure. Uh, just, if you are going to make a change, just be, just be clear in your motion of approval and direct it because then we can bring it back for second reading with that change and not have a third reading. I was going to get consensus from everyone so that we can determine and there's a hundred where people would like to go. I don't think you can Yeah. Okay. Can I just mention one other thing? Yeah. Yeah. I know we're looking to increase the threshold for town manager signature from 2000 to three to 5,000. I will mention, you know, sometimes it goes the other way. So during the recession of 08, 09, I know the town manager at that time implemented his own policy to go the other way. Even if he had authorization for department heads to sign an invoice up to $2,000, he implemented a policy to review every invoice over a thousand during a very lean financial time. So I think the point on that is we still will have safeguards there. We'll have professionals who are reviewing this. The manager, whoever is in the manager position would have that independent discretion to implement their own policy should they choose to do so that might increase that scrutiny. You're basically handing the authority is what you're doing, but the, the manager, uh, he or she could, could decide to, to go in a different direction if they'd like to. I just wanna mention that. Thank you. So just to be clear, the consensus was to raise the 75,000 to 100,000, but to keep the two to 5,000 increase at where it is so that um, whoever makes the motion is state that appropriately and it will come back to us for second reading with that correction or I should say change. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from council? 
Anything else to add from staff? The only thing I'd like, like to fall back on, on just regards to the facts, it might be worth checking in with uh, TMO. So I think they have uh, sensitive documentation that they still receive facts. And that might be the same way with uh, some of the bid process on um, stuff that they're doing with contract for. So I know we didn't agree to the group fact, but just uh, I don't want to fall back. Just mention that they still may require facts for quite a while. We're going to leave that in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Adrian, you want to do this one since you sure. calculated the. You're telling me you want me to read this whole thing? <laughs> Um, yeah, hold on. I'm just finding the municipal code location for the it's four four dash six dash one fifty. Yes, it's it's well, four it? sections. I can help you when you get to it, but it should be number two in the memo as well. I can just reference the memo. That's fine. Okay, great. Um, I move to approve on first reading an ordinance of the Town Council of the Town of Telluride, Colorado, amending the Town of Telluride Municipal Code at Chapter Four, Revenue and Finance, within the section. 4-6-140 approval, section 4-6-150 formal contract procedure, section 4-6-220 competitive sealed bid, section 4-6-230 competitive sealed proposals, section 4-6-240 small purchases, section 4-6-250 miscellaneous exemptions, section 4-6 dash 260 emergency procurement, section 4-6270 state, federal, or CML bid for the purpose of adjusting the dollar amount threshold for formal contract procurement, professional services, department and town manager approval, and updating exemptions to include co cooperative groups, and direct the town clerk to set this matter for a public hearing on second reading of the same on March 28, 2023, with the following change um, as noted in number two of the town of the packet altering the fifty thousand dollar limit to a hundred thousand dollars in the four sections of the code great i'll second motion from adrian and a second from c ray any further questions oh, okay how do you vote adrian yes jesse ray yes dan yes and yes TVS. Large yes. Plain yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Kyle. Item number nine, Telluride for Licensing Authority. We don't have any items today. Item number 10, administrative reports. I would like to go back up to, if staff is ready to do this, um, from the morning administrative report that we didn't get to do number 2A1, which is sandwich boards and the Hickox rule. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I've got a number of manager uh, updates, uh, but we will start here with uh, kind of a point of conversation around uh, town and the business community, particularly along Colorado Avenue over the last uh, few weeks here in this winter in particular. Uh, so I'm going to just do my best to summarize uh, what our sandwich board rules are outside of uh, local businesses and uh, what we call the Hickox rule as well. Um, I just encourage our town attorney or town clerk or our planning director who's also in the room to add in any details that I might miss here. But um, I, I think what has kind of been lost to memory uh, over time in Telluride is, is the fact that sandwich boards are actually prohibited on public property per our land use code. Um, they're not, or I'm sorry, they are only allowed on private property. And, and again, we see a bit of a proliferation based on seasonality of those sandwich boards out on public sidewalks. And they, they have been pro prohibited for many, many years. Um, but um, as enforcement changes, some of the uh, memory of some of the rules uh, change over time too. Um, the Hickox rule itself uh, was issued back in 1987 by town manager Gary Hickox. Uh, the rule allows Colorado Avenue businesses uh, in particular to place merchandise on the sidewalk outside of business. Merchandise may uh, protrude no more than two feet from the building. Uh, the Hickox rule also prohibits merchandise uh, from being placed on the sidewalk specifically during Bluegrass Festival, Fourth of July, Jazz Fest, film festival, 
and Grateful Dead concerts. So <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the uh, period of time this was written. So no merchandise during Grateful Dead concerts, please. Uh, council discussed the Hickox rule at their May 25th of 2001 town council meeting and directed the town manager at that time to update the Hickox rule to uh, allow all businesses to begin utilizing the two feet of sidewalk outside their business, not just on Colorado Avenue, but anywhere in town, um, to allow merchandise on those festival weekends that I had mentioned before, and to allow non-liquor licensed establishments to place a table uh, like a two top or whatnot um, into the space. Um, I would say that additionally, the Hickox rule, uh, again, has never allowed sandwich boards to be placed on public property. Um, now, those sandwich boards um, have not been, frankly, enforced uh, very often for, for quite a few years. So there has been confusion that may have been, uh, that they may have been allowed at, at one point in time. But as of now, we have had requests from council members or various business owners over time to enforce those sandwich uh, board rules. So our code enforcement staff has been doing so recently, which uh, causes some of the course of these questions and, and some of the concerns. Um, it would take a, a modification to the land use code. Uh, we would have to amend that to allow for sandwich boards on public property um, and not just an update to that Hickox rule. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Hopefully that is just a very brief overview of, uh, again, the, the rule itself and sandwich boards in particular, and maybe just open it up to, to questions. Um, Tiffany, Kevin, uh, please jump in here if I missed anything of important, but we'll see what comes up. That was great. Thank you, Scott. Council, questions, comments? Uh, I'm guessing that you all saw the email that we got, two separate emails with two to three comments per email from people in the business community um, asking about sandwich boards and kind of converging the Hickox rule with sandwich boards. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to explain at our public meeting the difference between those two distinct things. Comments or questions? I have a question. Maybe this is more to Ron, but I think it's to everyone. Like, Historically, I imagine there are other communities that do not allow sandwich boards by zoning. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious like what the context is behind that. I can understand like blocking of sidewalks and safety of pedestrians, but if they're theoretically not doing that, what is the reasoning behind not wanting to have sandwich boards? Well, I think the distinction is on public property or public rights of way. Sure. Um, they're not allowed. Um, and, and typically that's because of the concerns for access, um, pedestrian movements and that kind of thing. Um, some, some communities allow them, some prohibit them. It's really kind of discretionary based on the jurisdiction. Um, but so why, so we allow restaurants to basically purchase space on our public rights of way to have outdoor dining, which then limits the pedestrian public right of way on sidewalks. So why is that not an option that we would consider? And I know I'm not necessarily phrasing that in the totally accurate terms of legal legalese, but why, how is that different from people requesting sandwich board signs? I'll follow up quickly on that. Uh, if it's appropriate. I think outdoor dining, which is the other example that's been cited, and I don't mean to to cast one or the other in a kind of a affirmative or a disparaging way, but outdoor dining, usually the uses are clearly segregated. There's railings, there's separation between the, the space that's being used for the private purpose that's in the public right of way, and the remaining area that's for the traverse of a pedestrian. Sandwich boards, I think inherently, and I've done some research on this, a lot of jurisdictions look at them as kind of a unique tripping or obstruction hazard. And we have been sued on or threatened to be sued on planters in the right of way, steps in the right of way. I think sandwich boards would certainly fall into that category as well, because I do think they are kind of a unique tripping and obstruction hazard. I would also point out that they're not particularly secure. So the winds that we've had in the last week, I think would be a really good example. I saw some of this around town. The sandwich board would have flown right out. Um, and I did see that in a couple of occasions where the sandwich board, if it was if it was in that location, 
could not withstand the winds that are sometimes typical in a mountain environment like Telluride. I think that's why we've had that blanket prohibition. Um, another one that I'll just paint the picture. So think of a storefront. 25 feet is basically the width of a storefront in the town. So imagine walking down Colorado Avenue and every 25 feet, because pretty much every business, if you change the rule, would have the ability to put a sandwich board out there. Every 25 feet, having a sandwich board in front of the facade. Now, maybe that's maybe that's a desired outcome, but I think that's part of the, the messier aspect of a sandwich board versus, let's say, an outdoor dining license agreement where the area is segregated, it's fenced, and we also have insurance indemnification. I don't know that we'll get insurance or indemnification from a realtor, um, a retail, excuse me, retail entity that wants to put a sandwich board out there. You might require it if you want to go that way, but that would be, I'm not even sure that they could get insurance and name the town as additional insured for a sandwich board. So maybe that's part of kind of the thought of why this has been prohibited for 20 plus years. But again, council, you hold that legal ability. If you'd like to change it, certainly give us direction. I think that latter point that Kevin's making um, around the aesthetics uh, of sandwich boards is what you see a lot of uh, communities focus on just the, the inability to you know, regulate the, the overall aesthetics of your main street, if you will, if if every business were to uh, take advantage of that. So I think liability and, and aesthetics are probably those two main drivers, as, as Kevin mentioned. Can I add, just so just on the liability point, so if somebody was to trip over a sandwich board and fall and break the wrist, or if one of these sandwich boards was to be airborne and hit a child and they get stitches in their head like who is liable whose fault is that who gets sued everybody if they're not i mean everybody's going to get sued but like so who's got the deepest pockets yeah so the town's the owner of the property and you have the responsibility of making sure that your property that the the activities that are conducted on your property are conducted in a reasonable manner that's usually the the phrase that's used and the converse of that is you cannot have a what's called a known dangerous condition in your public right of way so courts would get to decide whether a sandwich board on a windy day that flew out and hit someone. And, you know, they're not that insubstantial. If you were hit by one that's three feet high and two feet across and some are metal and some are wood, um, you can imagine that there were, there could be a consequence and maybe a significant consequence to something like that. Whether it would amount to a known dangerous condition, I, I can't tell you. But generally, we try to avoid liability in the first place rather than fire away out of it. So I, I think we would probably find ourselves in a lawsuit if anything like that happened, that we may have a, a, any number of defenses that would get us out. I, I generally didn't have a problem with sandwich boards, but then I agree with what Kevin and Scott have said ab about them. I just I think aesthetically, but then I think also from an insurance standpoint, it just I, I don't want to put us at risk. For that. I mean, I know the business community would like to see him, but I think we can live without them too. That's just my two cents. I agree with you. They're illegal and durable too. I had this meeting, I generally was coming in in favor of allowing them. You know, I think that we've, even though they were technically illegal, they, they've existed in our town for the last 10, 20 years, and it hasn't generally been a problem. Um, so it's the same, to me, it's the same sort of thing of uh, the pocket parks. We allow every business to apply for a pocket park, but not everyone does. And I don't think that every business will go out and- Parklet? parklet? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Parklet, not pocket park. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, will just, I don't think every business is going to go out immediately and put up a sandwich board if we allow them. Um, we might see a few more, but I don't think it's going to be an excessive amount. I'd want to cover our liability. The other concern I had going into this is make sure we maintain access for ADA, especially uh, making sure that we uh, crafted it in a way that they have to allow a certain amount of space that's in line with what ADA regulations require for access for people in wheelchairs in particular. So I'd want to consider a few details like that. I think in general, I still 
would be in favor of crafting ways to allow it. I don't think it impacts our town too much. I think it promotes businesses. We've heard pretty clearly from every business that has taken time to comment that they want them and they have existed whether or not they were allowed for some time in Telluride. So I feel like we could craft it, but. I, I as a business owner in Main Street for several years, um, one of the issues that I noticed with people putting sandwich boards out is that they get moved, you know, like if somebody has a stroller or there's a, a large group, like, so it might start off by the building, by someone's entrance. And by the end of the day, it's three feet, you know, away and two, two feet down. So I think that that's a big issue. And then I do think that the liability component um, is huge. So I'm actually not in favor of allowing this one. I'm going to take the stance from a conversation we had, I don't even remember how many times, four, six, seven, with parklets, and the equitability of how those were working on the north side of Colorado Avenue and the south side of Colorado Avenue. And we need to remember the minimal width of the sidewalk on the south side of Colorado Avenue and other places off Colorado Avenue. And are we going to, as we have if we have staff go down this road of doing research, and then we have a lot more public comment about equitability between businesses, and are we ready to go down um, that avenue? I, The whole liability thing, first and foremost, is a concern for me because people who sue go after the people with deep pockets, and that would be the town, period. Um, if something was crafted, I'm sure we could come up with language that could cover that, but for me right now, I'm also not um, in favor of moving forward with this. The fact that it's been happening illegally for more than a decade, to me, doesn't that argument doesn't hold water because people, instead of asking for permission, they were just doing it and it has proliferated in town. There's people who have two or three sandwich boards at one business on occasion. I think that's been nipped. Um, but... I, I feel like this is um, not ripe right now, personally. I think you brought up a really good point too with the sidewalk widths on the north versus the south side because it's like five feet difference. I mean, even more in some areas. I think Main Street's packed and we just recently, I don't remember how long ago it was, expanded the Hickox rule. So we've already encroached more for retail businesses and restaurants of using space outside of the building. And I think that that should be, that's enough. So I'm all the liability in it. To me, I'm sorry to comment again before others have had a chance. To me, I just don't view it that differently as allowing retail items on the sidewalk. We allow clothes hangers, uh, with our shoe racks or whatever on the sidewalks up and down it. And any, any business is allowed to do that. And we don't see a, an excessive proliferation of businesses doing that, only businesses where it's really appropriate. And so if we craft rules that uh, make it a little harder and speci specifically re require uh, an adequate amount of space for pedestrian traffic, I think it's still accomplishable and it's not that different from the rules that we have regarding retail on, on the public right of way. I'm in favor of keeping it just the way it is right now. And I would say to your point, Dan, the, people want sandwich boards in the middle of the sidewalk or like out farther. The Hickox rule is next to the building sort of out of the way. And so a sand, like, I don't really feel like there, you can compare apples to apples. Yes, we do allow things, but it's the physical, it's the actual location of where the sandwich boards are located. And I think it's gone in and out. I mean, I remember when I worked at the museum, I didn't know we had a rule. We tried to put a sandwich board downstairs or downstairs, <laughs> down on, on Main Street. And we had a marshal at the museum within like an hour of doing that. So there have been periods of time that the rule has been enforced. I just think recently it hasn't, which has been the issue. So anyway, I it feels like a whole to protect ourselves from liability, I think we would have to regulate the location, the type of sign, like the weight of it so much that it would end up being too expensive or not helpful to the businesses who want to have signs because they'd have to have sandbags and the, I don't know, a whole thing. 
can I ask a question? So, because I'm trying to picture places in my head where there are outdoor signs that you could equate to a sandwich board. The sign rule, I'm sorry to get down into the weeds a little bit on this, but the sign rule is if you have a business, you can have I believe it's up to two signs uh, advertising your business in whatever way that is. You can have a sign that hangs over that's approved and you can have a sign in your window or door or something that is approved. Yeah, wall sign, freestanding sign or projection. So if someone has a business and they want to hang, instead of having a sandwich board, they hang, here are our daily specials or here, whatever. If they want to hang it on their own building. What are the complications of doing that versus a permanent advertisement sign with the name of their business, if any? Did that make sense to everybody? Okay. So you're talking about a, a sign that projects from the building over the, over the right of way? Not necessarily projects from. If you're looking at a building mm -hmm. and they want their specials, I'm, that's the only thing I can think of to come up with it. And they want to have a hook in their building where they can hang a sign that changes daily. So it advertises whatever they're trying to advertise. Are there... I, don't know that, I think that our donor signs, they have to be, the design has to be approved. Yeah, there's limitations yeah. on Donna. size and they can't yeah, yeah, that's why I'm asking what are the complications of this and John is in attendance she she deals with signs almost I'm daily. just trying to think and, of a compromise or some kind of a middle ground and if somebody who rents a space or owns a building and they ask their landlord could we do this there if that might be an easier thing than actually blocking our public pro property and creating a liability issue I would look to Kevin to determine what constitutes a sign. And I know our sign code is not, um, it's not ideal. If the name of the business is not on the placard or um, dry erase board or whatever it is, I don't know if that constitutes a sign. We'd have to do a little more research on this, but I know the code, the land, this is in the land use code, just by the way. But it does break down signs into different categories, one of which is a business identification sign. I think what you'd be talking about, though, would be you'd be moving outside of some of those permitted areas. So you, business identification, residential identification, institutional identification, they don't allow for daily special identification on the sign regulations that we have right now. So I think my gut would be, number one, um, it would be a sign if you were going to erect that. And you're allowed to, and there are also limitations, I believe, on size as well. I can't recite those off the top of my head, but then it needs to fit into those categories. And those six categories that are actually, there's more like eight, but those are, again, in limited areas, directional, construction, for sale or for rent, and recreational or business or residential identification type signs. So I don't know that you get to put up your daily special. Okay. Um, I was just trying on a to protruding sign. Think outside the box of what we were talking about right now. So, oh, when Kevin, I, you could put it in your window, correct? You could, but then I think it would it would also count to a sign. But yes, we do see that typically on you know for a day or two, and and I'm not sure that there's direct enforcement on that. If it says today only 10 percent off, I was just thinking maybe it's 50 to soup of the day and not 10. You know. Not to go down a rabbit hole, but like just thinking about the Nugget building and it's like a different movie poster every week. It, uh, how's that different? It's the same size, but how's that different than filling in like what your daily specials are at a restaurant? It's not on public property though. But neither if you hung it in your window at a, re at a restaurant, it wouldn't be on public pr property. Yeah, either. we're talking all, all this is applicable to private property, just to be clear. Okay. But I don't know how we handle that. And I <laughs> don't like to respond on business. <laughs> oh, on a hypothetical. <laughs> it's not a current area of enforcement. I <laughs> so there we go. I just thought I'd put that out there for people to consider. Because what I'm hearing right now from the... A majority consensus of council is to leave things as they are many reasons not the least which is liability issues against the town yes um but food for thought 
so that if and when we get more public comments on people who can no longer have sandwich boards, maybe there is another way to compromise going into the future. Anyway. Yeah, you know, Mayor, I, as I've uh, talked about before, I'm, I'm uh, convening a uh, economic advisory roundtable, and, and we'll have a number of business owners and managers on that. Um, and I'm sure this will be a point of conversation this this spring and summer. And, and um, I will uh, I will challenge that group to come up with some pragmatic uh, uh, ideas or alternatives here that might help our way around this, um, and just kind of keep our ear to the ground with the business community on that front. Thank you for that. I think that that's probably the appropriate and best place to have that discussion. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you. Would you like to do the other parts of your I would love to. Report? Yeah, you bet. I've got a number uh, of items here for you this afternoon. I'll try to move through them pretty quickly. Uh, but I did want to update council and the community on uh, our special event local ticket sales uh, efforts here. And as, as you know, uh, at the town council meeting on January 10th, direction was provided to uh, uh, town staff to work with medium and major festival event organizers to implement a local ticket program for their, this year's festival season. Um, and we understood going into that, that local ticketing programs would vary by event and there would be different challenges from one organization to another. But um, I think we've uh, done a good job uh, at the staff level working with those event organizers to, to make sure they roll out something robust this, this year per council's direction but let them have a little bit of flexibility there. And uh, I, I do wanna just give a special thanks to uh, Stephanie Jacquet for uh, our Parks and Rec Director for really working uh, with those event organizers very closely, Amanda Balsley as well. And uh, just a quick report out on uh, the most recent local event sales efforts. Uh, Mountain Film um, has been selling from uh, December 1st till March 1st. Uh, they were doing early bird sales of their Palmyra Pass, uh, $50 off for early bird sales, which was great. They did some pretty extensive outreach uh, locally here via email, social media, news releases, and so on around their local sale uh, event. And they ended up, uh, as of March 1st, selling 62 passes uh, to Mountain Film, which equates to about 15% of their overall sales, which I think is, is, is uh, pretty robust at this point. Bluegrass, uh, as you know, just wrapped up also. Uh, they had a March 1st local sale at the uh, Kodo Studios, uh, 9.30. I think they actually started closer to nine due to a little bit of snow coming in that day. Um, they did, uh, Bluegrass did some pretty extensive outreach locally as well through email, social, and, and news releases. Um, they sold out of their um, 1,000, uh, four, or, I'm sorry, 800 four-day passes. So zero remain as far as their four-day passes. They sold out by about 12.30 in the afternoon. Uh, Single-day tickets still do remain, um, but 50 were sold on for the Thursday show, 79 for the Friday, 129 sold for Saturday, and 175 sold for the Sunday show. Um, and with that program, um, about ten thousand uh, dollars was uh, donated back to Kodo th for their assistance uh, through those ticket sales, which is fantastic for Kodo. Big thanks uh, to Kodo as well for just hosting that event, which is a big one. The line wraps around uh, past Town Hall here, and it it's fun to see. Um, but very robust ticket sales. Uh, again, no four-day passes remain. And Telluride Film also did a March 1st sale uh, starting about 10 a.m. There's a little more limited uh, local outreach since film does not uh, necessarily do social media, uh, but they did a sign at the Nugget and an email blast. They ended up selling two uh, their cinephile passes and nine of their festival passes for a total of 11 total uh, local tickets sold through Telluride Film so far. So that's just a quick update on uh, where each of the special events uh, have been at from their local ticket sales. And um, uh, again, we'll continue to work closely with them on an annual basis, um, every event in that medium and, and large. Uh, uh, yeah, is that right? Medium and. Sorry, which categories were you? Yeah, our medium um, and large events uh, hit, those, hit those markers. Um, any questions on that front, Mayor? I have a quick question. Do we know how many more tickets or how many more four-day passes could have been sold or would, were requested after the sellout? That's a good question. Um, I don't offhand. Um, certainly, um, uh, I can tell you that the remaining single ticket day uh, sales will, will be at the box office 
for uh, locals. during the best for locals, but at the box office, not at Kodo. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wouldn't be able to tell you off, offhand how many more they could have. So. Okay. Uh, certainly the the interest is is high for those four day passes. Mm -hmm. So that's something we'll we'll be in conversations with with bluegrass about uh, no doubt next year. Just to clarify my understanding unless something has changed from when we had our meeting with them is that next year going forward, they will have two different on sale dates, which are still yet to be determined for local ticket sales, and that, People can just buy tickets on, they can just keep buying tickets. There's not a limited number. So for local tickets will go on sale before, before the general public. So if 4,000 four day passes are sold to locals, that's how many get sold. That's my understanding from the presentation. And I'm seeing a few other people nod. So those dates are still to be determined though. Can we just make sure we get all that in writing with the bluegrass? I mean, that's how the memo read their narrative. No, I think you're I think you're right on there. Okay, uh, move on to the kind of the next update here. Uh, again, as we've been talking about for a, a few months now, um, the Valley Floor Open Space debt has been paid off as of February, which is fantastic. Um, and I just want to you know, pose to council um, that uh, we would love to put together a community celebration uh, May 9th is Valley Floor Day, um, but any thoughts you have around what that celebration might look like? Uh, we are in the uh, quick planning phase now. It doesn't have to be uh, May 9th, certainly, but I think uh, anytime you have that kind of a historic marker uh, that we're able to pass, uh, you know, it, it deserves celebration and it's an incredible accomplishment for this community to, to pay off what uh, in the beginning was almost a $50 million uh, acquisition. So congratulations to uh, Open Space Commission, previous town councils, this council, and it's, it's just amazing to see that Valley Floor uh, debt paid off. Uh, along those lines with the Open Space Commission, yesterday, uh, Lance McDonald and I did meet with, with the commission, and I know Jesse Ray will uh, no doubt provide some updates later during our, our council updates, but I thought we had a very positive uh, discussion around the concept, again, of reallocating a portion of the 20% the revenue that's currently mandated towards open space to go towards other needs as we look out in the future um, while we're still working to ensure that we've got the, the appropriate level of, of funds for robust open space management, staffing, and, and a seed of reserves to make sure we can go after future open space acquisitions. So thanks for the commission's uh, just collaboration and, and, and dialogue around that really important issue and uh, more to come on that front uh, with them, no doubt. Um, another celebration we're beginning to discuss is 4th of July and uh, really beginning to talk internally here around what role the, the town can and, and should take um, in collaboration with nonprofits, for-profits, anyone who wants to, to help be a part of that uh, 4th of July celebration. We know the fire district needs to step back from a, a few of their uh, you know, long time um, efforts. And I think it uh, is appropriate at this point in history for the, the town to play some role and, and really ensure that after the parade, uh, the community and our visitors have you know some really positive, um, interesting activities to be involved in, whether that's a free community concert or anything in between uh, we're beginning to discuss. I know me and Geneva and I are going to sit down uh, later this week and start kicking around some concepts that, that you've been um, kind of hearing about or thinking about, and we'll certainly be glad to open that up broader to, to council as well. Please check in with me before you all sit down because I have a list of groups who have been a yes. for the past two and a half years. Oh, that'd be great. We have those. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, and and I think that's a great point in that not just pinpointing and earmarking specific businesses. Yeah, I like okay. that. We certainly don't need to carry or want to carry all the water on, on this. We want to collaborate with a very uh, uh, eclectic and uh, innovative uh, community here, especially on the arts and culture front. So, looking forward to. Uh, some some great thought around 4th of July in particular. Um, wanted to update council that I am in some discussions with uh, I think a really well-respected ballot strategy firm in Colorado here to, to just uh, consider contracting for some survey work related to a potential ballot uh, question that the town may want to uh, put in front of voters this November of 2023. Uh, as we've discussed in, in council meetings before, 
there's obviously this ongoing need to fund uh, really critical and state mandated wastewater treatment plant improvements that are out in front of us, some capacity increases to wastewater treatment plant, our water and street infrastructure upgrades and uh, a number of other uh, deferred facility needs. Uh, we heard about, uh, we heard some, some needs from the museum today um, to uh, town hall. So we will uh, begin to uh, put some, some work in with a third party around some um, strategy for a 2023 uh, November ballot. Uh, again, that's not saying uh, there will be anything on, on this year's ballot, but I think it's important out of the manager's office and finance in particular to really start um, uh, ramping up our speed of, of, of efforts on, uh, on that front, uh, whether it's with finance, our Hilltop securities team that we work with, uh, or others. So look for um, something on our upcoming agendas here in front of council to really uh, discuss next steps on that front. From an RFP or request for proposals front, it's uh, it's been a busy month for sure. Um, there are really uh, around seven RFPs that are active right now between what are currently out for advertisement and those RFPs that have just uh, um, had proposals due. Um, right now, uh, we're quite active with the Building F uh, Shandoka uh, RFP. That deadline has passed. Um, we did get one um, proposal in. Um, we're really pleased that it is a, a robust proposal from well-known uh, contractor and design firms. Um, so I am putting together an internal RFP recommendation uh, committee that would include uh, Lance McDonald, James Van Hoosier, Kaylee Ranta, our finance director, and myself, to put uh, a review together of that proposal and come back to council with a recommendation uh, on that front. Um, and uh, again, we're, we're happy to at least have the, the one proposal from a, a really uh, well-known and uh, tried and true uh, development team. So we'll see what that looks like um, and bring it back to you um, ASAP. I'd say the other RFP that is still out there um, is the RFP for a public-private partnership on our Tower House and Canyonlands property which is just east of Clark's Market, as you know, um, that uh, those proposals are due April 18th. Uh, yesterday, we just hosted a, a Q&A session uh, for anyone interested. And I think we had about four uh, teams uh, that were on that call just to ask uh, various uh, questions of the uh, RFP and make sure they were um, heading down the right path. Um, so it was a good dialogue that uh, uh, Lance McDonald, James Van Hoosier, and I had with uh, with those folks related to Canyonlands. Uh, let's see. We've also. Oh yes. Interrupt. Was that like was that generally good feedback? People are excited about the project, and or, you know, were there was there more they were hoping and to like what was the nature of the question? Yeah, you know, happened? honestly, there there weren't a whole lot of. Uh, uh, in-depth questions that came in, which um, usually is a good indication that you've covered a lot of detail within the RFP. Um, I, I think they they had questions related to flexibility on uh, whether it be some of the AMIs or um, you know layout uh, and design. And uh, again, between Lance and I and, and THA, I think we tried to weave in a lot of flexibility into this RFP, not wanting to quelch anyone's um, ideas or proposals uh, really allow for, for all comers, uh, whether it's local or national, um, and see what we can get in front of us, because that, that project will be a first public-private in, in quite some time uh, for the town, and we want to, again, allow for maximum flexibility, um, knowing that there are some sidebars on, on what we would allow for. Um, so, again, a, a little bit of the nature of the questions, Geneva, uh, but we were glad to see that number of teams uh, come around for the Q&A. doesn't mean that's that there won't be more, of course, proposed. So uh, let's see. Uh, we've we've gotten uh, responses back and the deadline has has passed now for our short term rental or STR data analysis and data analysis and program evaluation. Uh, we have two different firms that we uh, will be considering. Um, and uh, much as uh, we're doing on that Building F uh, RFP uh, interviews, um, I'm putting together an internal RFP recommendation committee that would include uh, our town clerk, um, our town uh, finance director, uh, and myself, along with our deputy manager, uh, Zoe Denal, to uh, see what we've got uh, that has come in related to STR analysis. So really looking forward to going through those. We'll come back to council at your next meeting here in late March 
with a recommendation and hopefully can move forward with the firm so that they can uh, get going quickly on that STR uh, data analysis. Uh, so that then we can really uh, get that data in hand, come back to the community and council, and again, have some robust community conversations this spring and summer as we look to uh, just revisit our current STR policy prior to that November sunset of our current uh, uh, voter passed uh, regulations on, uh, on STRs. So more to come on that front, but again, a lot of uh, momentum and progress, I think, on the STR front as we build up towards those important policy discussions this, this spring and summer. Scott? Yes. On this section of your report, can I please jump in? You bet. I don't want to lose any momentum. And if staff is waiting for this from us, I didn't want it to go for too much longer. Several meetings ago, we had the Lot L conceptual plan and feasibility study presented to us. And I believe from that information we received that day that the next step is for council direction to either put out an RFP for a design build crew team, whatever, um, whatever that may look like. Uh, and I'm just trying to determine if council is ready to give said direction so that we don't lose any momentum because I am getting a lot more questions in the community about they think we're just going to build what was presented to us. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Right, That's right. feasibility study to see what's even possible. The next step would be an actual design, which is where you get into the nitty gritty and have a lot more public process. Right. So I saw a couple thumbs up, yep. nodding. Well, the other question was, are we gonna make another subcommittee for that? Or is that gonna be falling under the manager's department as opposed to THA? This parking structure, even though it does have housing in it. Could department heads discuss that and let us proper movement forward for a subcommittee yeah. like yeah you bet absolutely uh, that is uh obviously lot l of, of shandoka is uh, a really significant project in front of us here that has uh, to your point mayor uh, just gone through a feasibility analysis not a design and uh I, I saw i think seven seven thumbs up there to really move to that next step of uh, soliciting for design and planning services around that which again would would in, entail uh pretty robust public comment and, and input. Um, so we're happy to, uh, to press the gas on that one as well. Uh, certainly we have a lot of balls in the air right now on the housing front, which is why we have just hired a community housing manager in, in part. So uh, we're happy to do that and can come back to you here quickly, Mayor and Council with a little more detail after a department head meeting on kind of what, how to, how to kind of begin to but to be clear, your decision should not be <laughs> that THA is the entity that agreed that handles that project. Agreed. Yeah, no, had, no, I'm hearing it's pretty expressly discussed, like other council members wanted to be involved or yeah. and also THA does not have the capacity. It's just yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And again, we're, I think, doing uh, everything we can at the staff level to, to pull a bit of the administrative work, if you will, off of THA's platter. Okay and be able to handle that in, in, internally and bring you well thought recommendations um, and uh, to get that in front of the public for, for their dialogue. Um, not else, yeah. I'm the one who brought it up and I definitely That's wanna keep great. momentum. I want to put out there that I know there's a lot of balls in the air. And so, and the March 28th meeting is going to be quite involved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If this is something that you prefer to and staff in general prefer to bring back to us for the April 18th meeting. I don't want you to feel any qualms about that. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with later okay. as well. I would rather okay. do the things that we already have going well than add another thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, thank you. Appreciate that, uh, that direction. Uh, let's see, just to begin to wrap up here um, from an HR uh, standpoint, We've got uh, we've got a marshal's uh, sergeant and a deputy position open that are really uh, critical uh, that we are uh, continuing to advertise and a town engineer position open along with an equipment operator and some seasonal streets crew that uh, we would love to see some great candidates coming in. Um, kudos to our HR team in particular, 
uh, Julia and Sydney, who have just been doing a great job getting out there, recruiting, onboarding as quickly as possible. And uh, again, we've uh, we've got some great staff coming in. Uh, but with that, I want to also um, uh, lament the uh, the loss and the retirement of Jason White, our longtime Galloping Goose uh, manager and, and transit uh, director for almost 20 years now with the town of Telluride. Amazing guy, amazing work he's done over the years, taking care of the goose and taking care of our public. And he is off to the Appalachian Trail to hike the length of that uh, amazing, amazing trail corridor. We wish Jason all the best and uh, we know he'll be back around sooner than later. So thank you, Jason. Uh, let's see, I think I'll just end with the fact that tomorrow, uh, March 8th is International Women's Day. So just wanted to give a thanks uh, and a big, big shout out to all of our female leaders on town council, our boards and commissions, and of course our great staff. Um, we'll have some uh, really cool social media out there on our town's Instagram uh, tomorrow. If you want to check it out, just celebrating our women of Telluride. So Mayor, I will leave it at that. Thank you, Scott. Jason White, if you are listening, we all love you and hope you have a very safe trip, <laughs> but we hope you're not listening. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you're driving somewhere and listening. <laughs> hey Scott, would it be possible to get like a little summary of your manager's reports emailed or um, absolutely. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. I think that we covered then the stuff from the morning that to put till the afternoon. So going into 10 administrative reports, 10A, is there an attorney's report? I will spend some time, Mayor, on a couple of updates. You've been hearing from me at council meetings in the recent past about we've, we've been waiting on an order, we've been briefing a legal issue to the court, now it's at issue, waiting for the order, things like that. Well, since your last meeting on the 14th of February, we have had two district court orders that have been um, released by the district court, two different district court judges, but I just wanted to give a brief overview of those two orders that have been issued. The first is on the Archie Play Tyrite Arts Transfer Warehouse litigation. You may remember this was the P&Z Planning and Zoning Commission approval of a PUD amendment that altered the roof form for the transfer warehouse. That decision, that PUD amendment, uh, that decision by P&Z was appealed to town council. Town council had a hearing on an appeal in May of last year, and then um, the property owner, the neighboring property owner, Mr. Archie Play, submitted a complaint, a 106 and open meetings uh, violation allegation into district court. We just had a ruling on that issued on February 21st. Of the eight claims, basically, that the plaintiff was asserting against the town, almost all of them were rule 106 actions, alleging or finding some fault in what you or planning and zoning did in the underlying hearing. The district court affirmed the town on all eight claims and challenges, finding that everything that the town did, either at planning and zoning commission level or town council level, was reasonable and or consistent with the land use code or Colorado law. So that was a very positive ruling that came out a couple of weeks ago. And stay tuned. We may have some, um, some further updates on that issue in the very near future. There is still the open meetings, allegations, and the claims that are remaining on that. And we'll give you an update on that when I have that information. Uh, the second district court order that came down was on the litigation. It's been about three years old now. The litigation involving, <clears throat> pardon me, the Butcher Creek PUD. That decision was rendered on March 1st. You may remember that there were two remaining issues in that case. One was whether lot owners in that PUD had to consent to a rezoning of property within the PUD. The court on that issue ruled in favor of the town and the lot owners that a PUD cannot be amended solely by the original developer and the town of Telluride. When lots are sold, those new lot owners in the PUD have a right to consent or be involved with the decision involving a rezoning or change of a planned unit development for that lot. And then the other re was regarding the specific status of the lot in question, lot A, 37 acres, kind of above Butcher Creek and then behind the elementary, excuse me, behind the um, high school and up to the Judd Weeby, that lot A was designated as common open space and the court found that that designation was meaningful and had a specific meaning under the Colorado Planned Unit Development Act, which means that it's for the enjoyment and the benefit of residents, occupants, and property owners in the PUD and changing that can also not occur without consent from those PUD members. 
again, finding in favor of the town and the lot owners on that decision. I have provided council with very detailed provisions in the court order on that. And you'll remember that this was from a three-day trial that involved a number of uh, town staff members, present and former, uh, at that three-day trial in November. The other important component of that decision, the court awarded the town our fees, our costs, and all attorney fees, which we know right now are well in excess of $100,000. Got a tracking down on Ohio. <laughs> so that's an update on the Butcher Creek PUD litigation. I'll also just kind of give you a summary on this. Late last summer, the town had six, six active legal actions against the town where we were being sued. We're now down to one. Go, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of people who have been involved. It's outside council. It's council assisting. It's staff, staff who have conducted depositions, offered direct testimony in court, assisted with briefing. It's It has not been insubstantial, but we are um, seeing some progress. So I want to give you that update. and also want to make sure that the public is aware of some of those cases and the progress we're making on those. So thank you. And less than a year ago. So that's very impressive. Thank you. Wow. Whew. That's a good report. <laughs> um, council reports. I don't have too much. Um, the biggest one was our monthly P and Z meeting. Uh, several PUDs went through on that one. The most relevant one was there was an extensive work session uh, on possible land use code amendments uh, regarding temporary uses and temporary structures. Um, as you all know, we currently allow for temporary structures for 180 days and then able to be renewed for another 180 days. Um, the direction that staff has received uh, is that we want to potentially expand the length of time for that application while still potentially constraining the amount of days a year that a temporary structure could be up for it. So planning and zoning did provide some direction on that, did uh, have a couple comments or ideas and staff will be bringing back potential options to planning and zoning before it gets elevated to council for uh, more discussion and potential ratification and adoption on that. Um, one, one further comment on that uh, for the upcoming uh, joint meeting with HARC, PNZ, and Council. Uh, that's a possible topic of discussion. They also wanted to put in the plug for um, possible amendments to PUD benefits uh, and amendments to, and potentially discussing Citizens Petition 300, which is the one limiting lot sizes as well. Uh, and potential changes or amendments to that as well. Uh, when is that, that co-meeting going to be? The 23rd. Coming up, a couple of weeks. Yeah, the 23rd, Thursday. Retreat day. In the morning. Yes. March I am. Like yeah, 9 March to 12, 23rd. thereabouts. No. And sorry, just to clarify, they wanted to put a plug in for suggested expansion or change to PUD benefit list. Um, I believe just change is what I have in my notes, okay. potentially removing at least one currently held PUD benefit that is accepted. Um, but we can discuss that more offline if you need further. No, Let's just go. wanna make sure, cause I think there was a uh, request out to Harkin PNZ commissions for topics for that retreat and it's coming up soon. Yes. and. Scott, do we have an ongoing list? When will we sort of see that agenda? Is there any more formal way to, uh, for topics for the joint meeting with Park and PNZ? Um, how do we go about setting that agenda for that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Dan. I, I think if um, if the question is, how do we start you know, building that agenda? I, I would suggest that um, if you can just, email myself and uh, I think Ron in particular, um, and just, we will start compiling that as, as that date draws near. We're, we're happy to kind of, particularly from you as liaison, um, start 
certainly building that. Yeah, I do have a short list and I will email that. Okay. To Planning and Zoning certainly has thoughts and feelings on topics they'd like to discuss. For sure. So, yeah, that'd yeah. be helpful if you, yep. if you can get that to me. Um, great. And then I can cover THA, I guess, if we want. Great. Um, had several meetings on that. We had a an exemption hearing that was approved with conditions. Uh, we continue our uh, general review and revision of the uh, affordable housing guidelines. We are almost done on that. We are into the appendices. There are some nitty gritty details that will likely require a healthy debate during that. And we, again, as I've said, in almost every Council update for the last year uh, that will eventually be coming to the full of council uh, for review on that. So it's an important document. It more and more people in our town are housed in affordable housing and it affects a lot of people's lives. So it does take time and care. Uh, I think that's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just had two meetings between this meeting and our previous Town council meeting. The first was with Kathy. Um, it was actually, a, it was a really great program. It's kind of nice to see the transition that they've been making. Um, but uh, there are presentations from Telluride Arts um, to bring more, um, just to bring more awareness to what the Telluride Arts District has to provide to the community um, and focus a little bit more so that that way they can promote each other um, and work together. Um, Kay was there to talk about the East End Master Plan and um, see if we could get as many voices um, to weigh in on what the county is working on um, so that that way their future plans reflect the, you know, the needs of all of our community. Um, Zoe was there to talk about the town's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion action plan. Um, which is going to be um, looking at the next five years um, and creating a guiding document to advance the town in um, leadership and community engagement, communications, internal um, employee life cycle. Um, and, I, you know, the Telluride magazine is actually going to be featuring the immigrant community in their next issue, which is um, it's just really exciting to have interviews with the community that, so that we can really just further the experience of what it is like in the rural area here. Um, and then there were just a couple of different other little advanced information just about English language classes, um, Coto Spanish radio hours, the Latino downhill ski day. Um, and something that I think just should probably just be called out. So if anybody's listening, uh, sign up is in person. Um, and so the ski day will take place um, Sunday, March 26, rentals, passes, lessons, and lunch will be included. Um, and then there was an introduction of Tabasum, who I hope I said your name right. I'm sorry if I didn't. Um, who's the new policy and advocacy manager for TCH. Yes, and she's lovely. Um, my next meeting was the gondola um, subcommittee. Um, and for anybody that's curious why there hasn't been a leadership committee meeting, there were internal conversations about the number of meetings that we all have to attend. And so we're really gonna try and focus um, any sort of leadership committee meetings as to specific benchmarks where we need to bring everybody together and also try and work that information into any of our intergovernmental meetings as much as possible. Um, we reviewed the SMART resolution to bring the gondola under that organization, what the governance is gonna look like, um, what the staffing needs are going to be, how we're gonna start the process of funding so that that way we make sure that SMART is not being pulled off of their um, overall vision and the other projects that they're working on while taking this work on. So there will be some sort of an MOU, intergovernmental agreement that's gonna be created. Um, and we're also gonna be looking at the procurement of subject matter experts to help guide the process further. Um, I think one of the things that came up that I was pretty concerned about, and Laura's you and I talked about it a little bit afterwards, is um, 
currently right now in the voting block, um, when we bring the leadership committee together, it, there's a massive inequity in voices between the town of Mountain Village and the town of Telluride and the county. And so the group as a whole was receptive to removing um, certain organizations up in Mountain Village from a voting voice. Hopefully, obviously, we're all going to walk together in lockstep. But I think as we go through this process, um, this is sort of where the rubber is going to meet the road. And we're going to be talking about funding and financing. And this is when we're going to start getting into stickier conversations. And so we want to make sure that um, everybody is represented equally um, or there's equity, a, especially yeah. if they're if the discussion is that two different organizations money is the same. Yeah, right. Well, and that's <laughs> the word sticky. Yeah. Yes. And so what I think this will come to the leadership committee for full for full discussion. What happened at the gondola subcommittee was essentially there was some agreement that TMVOA would not while they could participate in the conversation, they would not necessarily have a vote. Um, I think there's a little, there's some looks at some other organizations, obviously, that have votes in the leadership committee as well, and sort of what the roles they'll play. But really, ultimately, you know, this is something that I think needs to be addressed and finalized before we move forward with any other discussions. And so I'll keep you posted. Um, we haven't, you know, obviously, no decisions have been made quite yet, but. Two questions. Mm -hmm. One on the gondola subcommittee. I know that those meetings for the leadership committee are going to kind of be called as needed or coincided with IG meetings, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yes. Can you just make sure that we get at least two weeks notice mm -hmm. when those yep. meetings may occur? Second question. When is the next CAFE meeting? Hold on. Okay. One second. Um, the reason I'm asking is because there is a nonprofit in town who would like to dedicate some funding to and work in conjunction with the Sheridan Arts Foundation to do a Spanish young people's theater or not so young people's theater performance. And I think that that meeting is before you said it's the 27th. 22nd. 22nd. Okay. I'll Always find the out. Fourth Wednesday. Okay. Um, do you want to connect them with me and then sure. we can even push it if, it if the timing is off we can kind of push it to the group prior yes. and then kind of follow up during yeah I, I mentioned to them that this group is a group that they want to definitely have conversation with or pull some a couple members from that group to come to our meeting even mm -hmm. yeah great I love that that's, that's awesome yeah. I think that's it sorry Thank everybody you. who might be listening who is involved with that group that I threw that out there into the universe but we got to get more heads in the game. <laughs> Me and I might just add to to the gondola discussion um, that your town managers, your county manager, um, kind of at the staff level, are now ramping up as of yesterday, um, meeting almost weekly uh, now to really do the you know kind of do the in the weeds work related to beginning to craft that funding. MOU just for this next couple of years, not the big uh, funding agreement, but the MOU that will, you know, uh, carve out finances for the for the planning, the design services, the consulting services are coming up next. So there's a lot of work going on, even at a tier lower than the gondola subcommittee, just just so you know, and, and I will keep you up to date on those fronts as, as well, even though you're not around that table, we're doing the work to bring to you uh, yeah. and thank you for taking basis. on that obviously it's we definitely, really very much appreciate it yeah I, I i would say from the manager's office standpoint i'm i'm kind of budgeting for that uh to take up a, a little bit bigger piece of time in 2023 than before for, for sure thank you scott you good then you yeah. adrian okay um i've got some updates from smrhj san miguel regional housing authority board um they have started sending out newsletters and I can't remember if we're doing it quarterly or monthly. I think it's quarterly. Yeah, that sounds um, good. So one went out in early March, um, which is kind of the first step in having more open communication with um, people who live in deed restricted housing to kind of give them a heads up about things. And then also within that newsletter will be content around education as far as making sure people really understand the various guidelines that they're living within. Um, part of that 
reach out is that in 2023, both county and town of Telluride deed restricted owners will go through a compliance check with SMRHA. So people should expect to be hearing from them. They're doing the county first and then the town later. Um, we also, uh, SMRHA is also contracting for a specific number of hours with rural homes, who's the organization that has done the Pinion Park development and then is also going to be doing a development in Ridgeway and Uray. Um, Courtney, who is in charge of SMRHA has a pretty strong um, understanding of lotteries and how those should work. And that expertise is unique to our region. And so she is going to be educating some other people in our region on how to facilitate lotteries um, and sort of get them up to speed so they can do them on their own. Uh, the anticipated lottery for Ridgeway is in May, um, and then the URA development will be in October, is the theoretical timeline for those lotteries. Um, and then another note is that SMRJ um, made a recommendation to the San Miguel County Housing Authority, and their setup is slightly different than ours. They don't have a THA sub like we do, but it was regarding um, having uh, more regulations on multifamily units that didn't really have any regulations or it was limited before. And so it's sort of having them more mirror our deed restrictions. There's some differences, but it's around ownership, who can be ownified, who can be owners, so qualified owners. And then they're also allowing qualified businesses who people who may own a business in the, um, or sorry, <laughs> already own deed restricted units in the county, but they're also business owners if they wanted to own another deed restricted unit in order to rent to an employee, that would be possible. Um, and so they put work, requ work requirements on that and also rental limits tied to the HUD numbers. Um, so they're trying to align their deed restrictions kind of to the towns a little bit more and more, not to us specifically, but just to have more of a common deed restriction. So that's cool. Uh, let's see, Parks and Rec, um, the pickleball v. tennis players drama continues. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's not, laugh it's not a laughing matter because it does matter very um, much to certain people. But anyway, Parks and Rec uh, made a recommendation for just like a schedule of sharing the courts, which is, we'll see how that works this summer. There is definitely some public comment and people feel strongly about pickleball and tennis court usage and sharing. Um, Film Fest received approval to use the stage for multi-year um, having films screened in the park with their festival now. Um, and then they also received um, approval for an extra day in Elks Park for their 50th anniversary, which also coincides with some case approvals of street closures and all that. And then additionally, the Food and Wine Festival, oh my God, the Food and Vine Festival, excuse me, um, received some approval to use Town Park as well. So that was the most recent meeting. Um, I'll just say with regard to the museum, thank you to Kiernan for that great report. And thanks to you all for hopefully being supportive of like whatever changes need to occur for that amphitheater to be used because it's a really special space that just doesn't get utilized. Um, SMART is on Thursday, um, and I'll just point out that I think an important component of that agenda is that there, the board will finally be adopting the Senior and Disabled Transit Service Report, which has been a multi kind of year effort, um, and that's a component of, a, of the intergovernmental agreement of like how are they going to support the seniors and disabled riders, so I think that's important for us to know that that's available. Um, that's all I have. That's a lot. That is a lot. <laughs> Senior and disabled tr transit service. And there's a whole report. Maybe I'll ask, I don't know if that should be sent to us. I can ask David once the board adopts it, just so we all can read it. Okay. So just wanted to add on to the THA sub recap. Um, I know you've been hearing us talk about how we're updating the guidelines. We are having a public um, education session two weeks from today. That's March 21st at 5 p.m. It's going to be at the Telluride Arts HQ Gallery. 
um, with Allie Slayton, our town associate attorney, assistant, assistant attorney, um, just to give a presentation about what is changing and how that might affect you. And we'll give the people the opportunity to ask questions. So if you own a deed restricted unit, or if you live in a deed restricted unit, or if you want to, this is a really good opportunity in a very low pressure situation to find out about our rules and rules that may have changed. So this will also come before council and we'll be on the radio, but this is an opportunity to ask questions um, and be in the room with other deed restricted uh, owners and renters. Um, and I will be there as well and probably some other members of the THA subcommittee. So we hope to see you there March 21st at 5 p.m. Tolerate Arts HQ on Main Street. Um, the other thing is we are meeting, uh, having our first meeting with Mountain Village regarding wastewater authority options coming up next at the end of next week. Um, so we'll have more to report back after that. Also look forward to the moving, moving forward with planning some of these community celebrations like the Valley Floor and 4th of July, because I think we have a lot to celebrate and everyone in this town works really hard. That's it. Just as an FYI, Valley Floor Day, we are actually in a town council meeting, just putting that out there. That is right. We can try to make it a quicker meeting and yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's gonna rain for snow that day. Yeah. Thank you, Geneva. Jesse, right? Um <laughs> but vending is set, I believe, Tiff for March 27th. So we're shooting for for vending. It's the it's later. That was that day before town. No, you're right. You're right. 30th at two. Yeah. So vending for summer application review and winter vending recaps will be March 30th. Um, open space, we had a really long meeting yesterday. Um, we did approve our work plan for council to now approve, which you guys will be getting here pretty soon. We're looking for editors and fact checkers for the kiosk in Bear Creek. Um, you heard me ask uh, Karen in today if we had anybody had reached out to him yet. So we want to definitely highlight some of that unique history um, in that valley. We have a site walk coming up for the Valley Floor just to see how the winter access for Nordic and trails foot traffic went. Um, not to reiterate what's been said, but Valley Floor Day is coming up. Um, we do want to celebrate a little bit extra just because it's going to be the first year that we've had the Valley Floor paid off. Um, it's been a long journey and lots of money. Um, we... Um, we are looking, so we spent quite a, lo a lot of time yesterday looking at past budgets and budget projections um, for what open space might need moving forward. Should we reallocate um, that 20% cut, cut from the top of um, our tax revenue? And we're looking at things like stewardship projects, capital projects, um, a reserve, operating and management, land banking. Um, and we really wanna do a, a thorough kind of analysis um, on all those numbers so that we feel confident with what we provide to you guys. Um, and let's see, Ethics commis, com, Commission, um, thanks to PNZ and Hark for supplying the four extra necessary board memories, board members to, uh, that we needed. And I think it switches in two years or one year, Delaney, do you know? Um, that flip flops every year. Is it every year? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and then Delaney will go over Hark, Sam Gill Watershed Coalition. Um, Adrian is set to go in April to the Southwest Basin Roundtable, which is kind of a bigger group of people um, that talk about the same things, watershed management um, and the science behind it. Um, we, I'm meeting with him um, this Thursday to discuss our two events that we're hosting this spring. Um, one is a watershed forum in mid-May or early June, and the other one is International Fly Fishing Film Festival, which is kind of cool, in late August. And then we're continuing our discussions on fundraisers coming, upcoming fundraisers. Um, and then lastly, registration for a Telluride R1 school district for the school year of 2023-2024 is open. So everybody has to do that. It's like, can we, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I swear we heard about that in July, like when my kids were in school. Don't forget to send so, your thing in. Okay. okay. It's March, yeah. 
Um, Adrian, I think you thought of oh, something. Yeah. As Scott already mentioned, International Women's Day is tomorrow and there is a equal pay bake sale at the community table, which is on Colorado Avenue and corner of Pine Street. It's from 12 to four. And the whole point of that bake sale is to educate people on pay and equity. And so the baked goods that are sold are priced according to the purchaser um, and whatever demographic they identify with. Um, so that's a great way to learn about pay and equity. And also this year, the 100% of the proceeds are going to a new scholarship that's created um, for, for Telluride High School graduating students. So um, great cause and fun little thing to do on International Women's Day. What, what are the times for that again? From 12 to 4. 12 to 4. Sorry, thanks. So me and basically covered the gondola subcommittee. So I've got that one covered. And then... <laughs> We didn't have a meeting for the Tarot Regional Airport Authority because they skipped February. So I got nothing. Been lounging, hollers. Been lounging. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. I'm trying not to be redundant with things that were already said. Um, case on the heels of the Parks and Rec Commission and their considerations did, in fact, um, go over street closures, which are being expanded for one year only for Film Fest and for Mountain Film. Uh, Mountain Film wants to go from their ice cream social right into a celebration for Hillary Nelson um, and have a band or DJ, DJ. I think. Um, so the street closure will basically be the entire day. And the Film Fest asked for extra nights at venues which were approved and therefore, um, the street closures kind of coincide with those, like an extra night at Elks Park or two, actually, now that I think about it. The feed, which is usually on Friday, is going to be on Thursday. So just be aware, um, listening audience, that there will be detoured traffic at times on more days this summer. And to please be careful. Ecology Commission. Zoe, thank you for your help with this commission now. and. We have a chart of members so that people are actually assigned to specific actions and programs so that we can focus in to what we're assigned to and get more things accomplished, um, which I think is going to be a real help. Uh, Black Bear Awareness Week, there's uh, the Trash Bash, which I think is going to be somewhere in the third week-ish of May in coordination with Sorry if I forget any group, Sheet Mountain Alliance and the Mountain Club and Eco Action Partners and to have specific areas dedicated with each nonprofit to go in and get people to come clean up trash and then have some kind of community event afterwards as well. Um, THA subcommittee, we already went over public forum on March 21st. We're actually having our special meeting tomorrow morning to try to get through the appendices. Fingers crossed. We have our upcoming retreat with HARC and planning and zoning. It's our normally scheduled retreat day in the morning, March 23rd, HARC, PNZ, Town Council. This is more for the public than us. Uh, the vending subcommittee meeting on 330. I believe the deadline for applications is March 15th. If you are interested in having a summer vending spot on town property in the dedicated spaces, those applications are due by March 15th. Um, the HARC board had their strategic planning meeting slash retreat last week, I think it was last week. And we it was a few hours and we went over where they were, where they are, where they hope to go. I conveyed a message that I think all of us, and I don't normally speak for all of us, but I think that we are all very pleased with the fact that that board is full and that it is functioning more efficiently. And a lot of that most recently is due to some of the changes that we helped push forward after staff brought it to us. And they are very grateful. The bottleneck right now is being alleviated, which has been a huge um, weight off their shoulders. And other things outside of that, um, Region 10, the thing that jumped out at me from the most recent Region 10 meeting was the board had um, 
given the go ahead to region 10 employees to get a group to work on data for the six county region for visitation and average daily rates on places, all the things associated with tourism. There were some very interesting pieces of information. We're still waiting, at least I haven't seen it yet, for a link for their dynamic dashboard to be able to go in there and you can look by county. One of the pieces inf of information they had was uh, visitation on main streets in various towns. And as you might imagine, Telluride was right up there. However, we have been bumped down to number four in many visitation criteria with number of days, length of stays, number of visitors in general. And it's very interesting when you lay over the graphs with certain elements of our, um, I'm gonna just say it, visitation numbers were down and ADRs leaps and bounds above everywhere else. And the people who are at the top of the list have the most steady average daily rates. I've been saying that for a while personally, but now I actually have seen data that correlates with that anecdotal opinion. Um, when I get the link, I'll find out what the ability to share it is because I think it's gonna help us all. Scott, with your um, business roundtable discussions and as we go forward with preparing for the future. And yesterday, the CAST Housing Task Force met. Um, sorry that none of us were able to go to CAST legislative meeting in Denver this time. It was just a hard time for people to go. And it's a long way for us to go for a four hour meeting and I, or a six hour meeting. And I've told them that. So we're hoping maybe we can um, have that's more simple. Well, the problem is they had nine legislators show up to have dinner with the attendees. So people really got uh, to put bugs in people's ears about stuff. So the task force meeting yesterday was uh, mainly focused on the tons of pending legislation at the state right now that actually has to do with affordable housing. Um, a couple of the highlights in case anybody likes to geek out like I do and go to the Car Colorado General Assembly website. <clears throat> House Bill 23-1115 has to do with the repeal of the provision prohibiting local governments from enacting rent control. They all really like to call that the Telluride rule, which we call, Kevin? Lot 34 case. Lot 34 case. Um, it's quite interesting. It's very short, easy to read what's being proposed. And that one is already passed through the House. Um, there is not yet a scheduled date for it to be heard at the Senate, and there's speculation sort of. Can you clarify a little, is that rent control on free market units? Um, technically, yes. And it's kind of, uh, the CAST Housing Task Force decided to punt it to the CAST Board to determine if we actually want to even put out a support statement on this one, because it seems like it could be quite problematic, especially in our mountain communities, to be able to go in and then say, here's rent control. Um, but it, it's really interesting, good read. Um, yes, it, it would also be on government built stuff, sure. but it goes that extra mile, if you will. House Bill 231190, Affordable housing right of first refusal. This one is a very interesting and it has to do with specifically multifamily um, developments and the idea that noticing could, depending on, this is all about local control and you don't have to do it, but you would have the opportunity to do it. If someone, if a municipality wanted to put into place a mandate that when a place came up for sale, that a local government entity is noticed and had 14 days to reply with their interest to put in a competitive bid. So it isn't just going in and it's not a taking, but actually be notified of the process in order to try to up your inventory. Um, and then Senate Bill 23001, Authority for Public-Private Collaboration Unit for Housing. And it is to try and designate um, a, a unit or an entity that is a public-private uh, 
collaboration, but it has a title, it has a name, and therefore it is offered some extra powers. It grants it authorities that may not otherwise be there. So that one's also very interesting. And the governor's proposal on statewide land use and housing, they haven't yet put anything in writing, but the governor's office is very much behind supporting communities in their efforts to uh, build and acquire more affordable housing. However, up until recently, it's been very much a statewide blanket kind of idea. And several of us from Mountain Communities have been speaking with various members of his staff to say, look, it's not a one size fits all situation. And they are apparently hearing those messages loud and clear. And one of the biggest ones is we need assistance potentially with infrastructure in our small removed rural communities in order to actually develop the housing. It isn't necessarily the development of the housing that is the issue. It is the supportive infrastructure to build said housing and they are hearing that message. So I just wanted to let you all know that there is a, there's many others, um, some that haven't been presented in writing yet that we're still waiting to hear about. Um, but I'd say there's at least eight current in play bills going on. So that's what I have for council reports. Anybody forget anything else? Okay. No related organization reports today. Nothing for number 11 Telluride Housing Authority. Item number 12 is an executive session. 12A, town attorney quarterly check-in for discussion of a personnel matter under CRS section 24-6-4024 F1 and section 4.6B of the Telluride Home Rule Charter and not involving any specific employees who have requested discussion of the matter in open session any member of this body or any elected official, the appointment of any person to fill an office of this body or of an elected official, or personnel policies that do not require the discussion of matters personal to particular employees. Could I have a motion to move into executive session? So moved. Second. Motion from Jesse Ray, second from Ian. Further, how do you vote? Jesse Ray, yes. Dan, yes. Adrian, yes. Neve, yes. Large, yes. Delaney, yes. Thanks everybody who joined us for the meeting today. Have a great day. And you don't have to all this one. Yeah, right. yes, sir. two to three minute break.
Okay, the time is now 425 p.m. on March 7, 2023, and the executive session has been concluded. The participants in the executive session were all seven members of town council and town attorney Kevin Geiger. However, for portions of the conversation, there was one recusal for council person Seanette and one recusal for council person Carlson. For the record, if any persons who participated in the executive session believe that any substantial discussion of any matters not included in the motion to go into the executive session occurred during the executive session, or that any improper action occurred during the executive session in violation of the open meetings law, I would ask that you state your concerns for the record. Seeing and hearing none, by unanimous consent, we are adjourned at 4.26 p.m. Woohoo!